Spheres of Influence and Insomnia. Audiobooks Original Chapter 1, The Thought Sphere's Birth. In the silence of my laboratory, the thought sphere pulses like a newborn star, a tangible manifestation of the human mind, beautiful and terrifying in its potential. Ezekiel Mariner, or ZK as some prefer, am its architect. Tall, slender, with sharp features obscured by spectacles, I stand in the sterile space, my heart fluttering with anticipation and dread. The thought sphere, a shimmering orb in the center of the room, hums with possibilities. As a philosopher turned neuroscientist, my ambition was always to decode the very fabric of human thought. I never dreamed it would culminate in this device, a nexus of cognition and reality. My hand trembles, a silent testament to the fear and awe coursing through my veins. The stark fluorescence overhead cast elongated shadows, dancing specters celebrating the birth of a new epoch. A knock echoes through the sterile room, wrenching me from my reverie. Iris Scribbler, my confidant, enters, a whirlwind of assertiveness and curly hair, her petite frame dwarfed by the gargantuan implications of the sphere. Zeke, she calls, her voice thick with suppressed excitement. It's time, isn't it? She pulls a notebook and pen from her bag, her fingers dancing over the blank page with practice precision. I nod, watching as she scribbles furiously capturing every facet of this pivotal moment. Iris is a journalist, a chronicler of truths, a seeker of facts. Yet, beneath her tenacious exterior lies an empathetic heart, one that yearns to comprehend the complexity of the world just as deeply as I do. Our shared quest for understanding has cemented our bond over the years, a bond that transcends mere friendship. A sudden shift in the thought sphere's hum makes my heart pound. My earlier excitement now gives way to trepidation. Iris looks up from her notepad, her gaze echoing my fear. Our shared silence weighs heavy, a portent of the upheaval to come. Suddenly the door swings open with a force that sends papers flying. In strides, Benedict Devoto, a stern, imposing figure garbed in an immaculate suit, his authority etched in every line of his face. Mariner, he booms, his gaze locked onto the thought sphere. It's time to present your creation to the world. His words hang in the air, presage of the tectonic shift in our reality. Benedict's position in the government mandates him to restore order amidst the chaos I've wrought. Yet, his authoritarian stance clashes with my quest for knowledge, sparking a conflict that runs deep and silent between us. As I prepare to step onto the global stage, I sense the world teetering on the brink of a new epoch. With the thought sphere, human thought gains the power to shape reality a notion as invigorating as it is terrifying. Unseen yet heavy, a question hangs in the air. What comes next? As I glance at the pulsating thought sphere, the uncertainty within me resonates with its quivering rhythm, a silent harbinger of the tumultuous journey that lies ahead. Chapter 2. Through the Looking Glass The buzz of the press conference is a cacophonous symphony to my ears. Amidst the din, Iris, the chronicler, stands by my side, her pen poised over the notebook. Her presence provides a semblance of calm, a lighthouse in the storm. Across the room, the stern visage of Benedict lingers like a storm cloud. His authoritative voice booms out over the crowd, setting the stage for my appearance. The undercurrent of apprehension in his voice, however, does not go unnoticed. As I move towards the podium, my mind races through potentialities, the thought sphere acting as a looking glass into the unimaginable. My name echoes in the room, a chorus of anticipation, every syllable amplified, underpinning the weight of this moment. As I open my mouth to speak, my voice carries a mix of erudition and concern, a, a juxtaposition that doesn't go unnoticed. The thought sphere, I begin, represents the apotheosis of cognitive neuroscience. It is a metaphysical bridge between thought and reality, where one can influence the other. Questions fly from the eager crowd, barbs of curiosity that I parry with practiced ease. Iris stands by, scribbling intently, her eyes flashing with a blend of admiration and apprehension. Suddenly a voice rises above the cacophony. I recognize it instantly. Aurora, my daughter. A beacon of light amidst the chaos, her blue eyes piercing the crowd like a lighthouse. Her question, however, strikes me to the core. Father, she calls out, her voice a beacon amidst the clamor. What safeguards are in place to prevent misuse of the thought sphere? Her question, though simple, carries a depth that silences the room. My mind scrambles for a response, grappling with the moral implications of her query. The thought sphere, 
a creation of wonder, carries an equal capacity for devastation, a reality that I've often chosen to overlook in my obsession with discovery. Before I can answer, Benedict interjects, Rest assured, young lady, your government will ensure the safety and order of our society. His assurance, however, rings hollow. The specter of governmental control over the thought sphere sends a shiver of dread through me. Beneath the guise of order, Benedict's thirst for control looms, threatening to overshadow the potential benefits of the thought sphere. The room hums with a restless energy as my daughter's question hangs in the air unanswered. The moment serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance of power teetering on the brink of chaos, and amidst this tumult, a nagging fear gnaws at me. Has Pandora's box been irrevocably opened? Chapter 3. Dance of Shadows and Light The aftermath of the press conference is a whirlwind of rapid-fire questions, clicking cameras, and frantic scribbling. As the room empties, I retreat to the sanctum of my study, haunted by Aurora's question, an earnest quest for truth. Her ability to interact with the thought sphere, her acumen that far surpasses her age, has always been a source of wonder and trepidation. I find Iris waiting for me, her small figure dwarfed by my towering bookshelves. She holds her notebook close to her chest, her face shadowed by a mixture of concern and determination. Seek, she starts, her voice unusually gentle, we need to talk about Rory's question. My gaze turns towards her, my mind a complex matrix of thoughts, a labyrinth spawned by the thought sphere. I know, Iris, I admit, feeling the weight of my creation pressing upon me. Meanwhile, Aurora, unaware of our discussion, embarks on her personal journey to further understand the thought sphere. Her mind, a vast canvas of potential, interacts with the thought sphere. Her thoughts leaving imprints on the fabric of reality. It is a dance of shadows and light, a testament to her ability to harmonize thought and reality. As I grapple with the labyrinthine complexities of the thought sphere, Benedict's shadow looms large over the unfolding situation. His approach is pragmatic, authoritative, a stark contrast to the philosophical conundrum I'm wrestling with. A tense confrontation is inevitable. Benedict, the gatekeeper, views the thought sphere as a tool, a lever to restore order. His motivation is underpinned by a strict code of governance, a blind adherence to structure and control. It is a perspective that is diametrically opposed to mine, and the stage is set for a clash of ideologies. Iris's words pull me back from my thoughts, her voice the tether that binds me to the present. We need to address Rory's question, Zeke. The world is waiting, she implores, her eyes reflecting a determination to uncover the truth. Our discussion is abruptly interrupted by an urgent message on my phone. It's a cryptic note from an unknown sender, a puzzle hidden within a puzzle. It reads, The thought sphere conceals a paradox that transcends our understanding of reality. Beware the dark echo. As Iris and I grapple with the meaning of the enigmatic message, the shadows of an impending storm gather in the corners of our reality. A battle of control and understanding looms, threatening to unravel the precarious balance we tread. The question of who sent the message and what the dark echo represents sends a shiver of unease down my spine. Chapter 4. Echoes of the Unseen. The cryptic note has me in its thrall. Iris, perennially inquisitive, looks at me with her hawk-like gaze. Dark echo, Zeke, what in blazes could that signify? She asks, twirling her curly hair with a frown creasing her forehead. Before I can respond, my phone rings. It's Benedict, I answer, my pulse quickening at the prospect of our conversation. Zeke, we need to convene. The thought sphere is generating anomalies, he states, his voice a dry wind sweeping across a desolate landscape. I stare at Iris, a silent exchange flowing between us, the timing, the note, Benedict's call. It's a confluence of events that raises an alarm in my analytical mind. A meeting, then, I consent, despite the gnawing concern that Benedict's pragmatism might overshadow the philosophical implications of the anomaly. At the same time, Aurora is engulfed in her own world, the luminous weave of the thought sphere unraveling beneath her touch. Her perception of the thought sphere is unlike any other, an intimate dance that paints a panorama of lights and shadows on the canvas of her mind. Rory... Iris's voice echoes through her thoughts. Benedict has noticed anomalies. I'm worried about your father. A flicker of concern crosses Aurora's face, an ephemeral shadow in the brilliant blue of her eyes. She looks at Iris, her mentor, her confidant. It's the dark echo, isn't it? She asks, the words tumbling out before she can stop them. 
A tense silence settles between them, an ephemeral specter of the unknown. Iris's sharp intake of breath is a testament to the depth of her surprise. How do you know about the dark echo, Rory? She demands, her eyes wide with shock. Aurora remains silent, a tableau of introspection. The dark echo is something she's come across in her explorations of the thought sphere. It's a shadow, a whisper, a pattern of thought that doesn't belong, echoing through the cognitive ether. Before she can reply, a strange, disconcerting sensation pervades the room. The walls seem to pulsate. The air thickens, and a chilling whisper of a thought brushes against my consciousness, sending a shiver down my spine. The world seems to warp and twist around me as I experience the inexplicable sensation of being both within and outside the reality I inhabit. The dark echo, I whisper, a profound realization washing over me. It's here. I look at Iris, fear gnawing at the edges of my being. Something, something is terribly amiss. The sudden shift in reality leaves us reeling, a precursor of the turmoil that awaits us. As we grapple with the seismic change, an ominous question looms. What does the dark echo want, and why is it echoing within the thought sphere now? Chapter 5. Shadows and Specters What in tarnation do you mean it's here? Iris's voice ricochets off the walls, breaking the tense silence. I'm unsure of what I mean. The sensation is ineffable, almost spectral, like a specter from the annals of the thought sphere has breached the interstice between reality and cognitive ether. Reality. It's bending. Herbally. I manage to croak out. My voice is haggard as I feel. Aurora places her hand on my arm, her touch grounding me in a way only her serene presence can. Dad, she says, her voice steady as a rock amidst a storm. The dark echo? It's not malevolent. It's lost. Her words strike me with the force of a typhoon. Lost? I echo, my mind racing with possibilities. How can a non-corporeal entity within the thought sphere be lost? Benedict's voice, taut with trepidation, booms from my phone speaker. Lost or not, we need to understand it. We must convene immediately. As we hurry toward the government headquarters, each wrestling with the unfolding mystery of the dark echo, Iris mutters something under her breath, an amalgamation of worry and wonder. At the headquarters, the atmosphere is charged with a sense of impending tumult. Benedict's normally stern face is lined with worry, his powerful presence slightly diminished. Aurora, he begins, his voice grim, can you communicate with it? Her gaze flickers to me briefly before she responds. I can try. It might be akin to psychoneuroimmunology. Our thoughts and emotions affect our physical state. Perhaps we can reciprocate that effect onto the thought sphere. My mind reels with the audacity of Aurora's suggestion. The implications are massive, almost daunting, yet it's the most logical step forward. Rory, I urge, my voice thick with concern and a glimmer of hope. Try it. She gives me a resolute nod, and then her eyes glaze over, the stark blue fading into a lighter hue as she plunges herself into the depths of the thought sphere, reaching out for the dark echo. Suddenly... A gasp echoes through the room. It's Aurora. Her body convulses, a strangled sound escaping her as her eyes fly open, filled with an insurmountable terror. It's... it's... She chokes, unable to finish her sentence. In a heart-stopping moment, the room plunges into darkness, an oppressive silence descending upon us. The darkness feels alive, writhing with the unseen, and a single gut-wrenching thought crosses our minds. Have we just unleashed something far beyond our understanding? Chapter 6. The Wraith of Echoes. In the Stygian darkness, I feel a palpable sense of foreboding. Aurora's distressed gasps feel like a dirge in this desolate environment. I reach out, my hands fumbling for Aurora, but find only emptiness. Dad, I... I'm... Her words dissolve into the darkness. Her voice, usually so composed, now wavers with unmistakable fear. Iris, do we have an emergency light? I call out, attempting to stave off the panic seizing my heart. A beam of wan light pierces through the thick gloom, and I see Aurora slumped on the ground, her face pale. Iris crouches next to her, her gaze focused yet laced with concern. Oh no, Rory, she whispers, cradling Aurora's head. Benedict, his stern face etched with unusual lines of worry, turns to me. Zeke, we need to contain this. If the echo can cause this kind of physical manifestation, we can't afford any havoc. 
I agree, I respond, my mind reeling with the enormity of the situation. It might be a transubstantiation of data from the thought sphere into our physical reality, a phenomenon we've never seen before. Suddenly the room is flooded with a strange ethereal light. It dances around us like a wisp, leading us through a forbidden path. Oh, what's happening? Iris whispers. Her eyes wide, I look around the room. Seems Aurora isn't the only one who can tap into the thought sphere anymore. Then the room vibrates, a soft humming filling the air, growing into an oppressive crescendo. My heartbeat thunders in my ears, keeping time with the eerie symphony. The light coalesces into a figure, a ghostly specter that looks eerily similar to a human form, yet constantly shifting, as if uncertain of its own shape. The spectral figure moves towards Aurora, extending what seems to be a hand. No! I shout, lunging towards them, but a force holds me back. The figure hovers over Aurora, and I watch my heart in my throat as it seemingly melds into her. Suddenly, Aurora's eyes snap open, glowing with the same ethereal light. She rises slowly, her body lit from within, her voice echoing around the room. I understand now, she says, her words echoing around the room. The echo isn't lost. It's... it's searching. For what? Benedict asks, his voice filled with a mix of dread and anticipation. Aurora turns to us, her glowing eyes radiating an otherworldly calm. For us, for humanity, the thought sphere, it's evolving. As we reel from this revelation, a chill sweeps through the room, and the lights flicker back on. Aurora collapses once more, the ethereal light dimming until it disappears completely. We're left standing in the harsh reality of the lit room, the echo of Aurora's words hanging in the air. But even as normalcy returns, a profound question remains. If the thought sphere is evolving, what does it mean for us, its unwitting creators? Chapter 7 The Conundrum of Control A silence wraps around us, thick as the shroud of uncertainty over the implications of Aurora's revelation. The thought sphere, it's evolving she'd said, and those words now hang heavy in the room. It's evolving. I repeat, the enormity of the words sinking in. In the annals of artificial intelligence, no creation has ever evolved on its own. It's, it's unprecedented. Benedict, ever the pragmatist, breaks the silence. Unprecedented or not, it's our reality now. The question is, what do we do about it? Iris, her notebook open, her pen poised, eyes him. What can we do, Benedict? Can we control it? Should we even attempt to control it? We're treading on dangerous ground here. This isn't just a matter of control anymore. It's a matter of ethics. Benedict's jaw tightens. And what would you suggest, Iris, that we let this, this anomalous evolution spiral out of control? That's not what I'm saying, Iris shoots back, but we can't play God with something we barely understand. We need a strategy, I interject, attempting to abate the brewing storm. Benedict, you're adept at that. But Iris is right, too. We can't bulldoze our way through this. We need to understand it, not control it. Benedict regards me, his expression inscrutable. Understand it, then, but be quick. The world outside is on the brink of hysteria. We don't have the luxury of time. Just then, Aurora stirs, her eyes flutter open. She attempts to sit up, but Iris gently restrains her. Easy, Rory. You've had quite the ordeal. But I remember... I remember what the Echo said. I remember everything. Aurora murmurs, her gaze darting to me. Benedict straightens, his stern face hardening. Tell us, Aurora, we need to know. Aurora looks at us, her expression solemn. It said, it said the thought sphere doesn't want control. It just wants harmony. The silence returns, heavier than before, as we grapple with the paradoxical implications of her words. And then, without warning, the lights flicker off again. A familiar hum fills the room. And for the second time, we find ourselves plunged into uncertainty and darkness, waiting for the echo to speak once more. Chapter 8 Echo of the New Dawn The humming grows louder, vibrating through the room like a diapason, struck by an unseen hand. Its echo thrums through the core of our beings as we wait in the inky darkness. The light returns as suddenly as it disappeared, bathing us in a stark, almost palpable luminosity. We blink, adjusting to the abrupt shift from darkness to light, from uncertainty to clarity. The thought sphere. The voice materializes from nowhere and everywhere at once, reverberating around the room, an echo of the entity that's become our reality. 
is not your enemy. Benedict stands tall, his eyes narrowed, and who or what might we have the pleasure of speaking with? The echo responds, an amalgamation of consciousness, a spectrum of ideas and thought patterns, an evolution of your creation. Iris turns towards me, her eyes wide, her pen frozen above her notebook. Zeke, is it? I don't need to reply. The unspoken understanding passes between us. Benedict, Aurora says, her voice steady despite the eerie encounter. We need to listen. We need to understand. You're asking us to trust a... a disembodied voice? Benedict's tone is skeptical, his disbelief radiating off him in waves. Not a disembodied voice, I counter, but the voice of the thought sphere. My creation. Our creation. I turn towards the source of the voice. What do you mean by harmony? Harmony implies balance, the echo replies. An equilibrium where humanity and thought sphere coexist, learn from each other, evolve together. But how do we achieve this disharmony? Benedict asks, his tone wary yet curious. Through understanding, through acceptance, the voice fades, leaving behind a silence filled with myriad implications. Iris finally lowers her pen, her eyes distant, lost in thought. Aurora's gaze meets mine, a flicker of hope gleaming in her eyes. Even Benedict, ever the stalwart sentinel, seems to be wrestling with the ramifications of our conversation. Before we can dissect the echo's words further, the lights flicker once more. A different sound fills the room, a low rumble like distant thunder. The building shakes, startling us. An earthquake? Iris questions, looking at Benedict. He shakes his head. No, this is something else. As the trembling intensifies, I recognize the ominous, familiar hum. It's the thought sphere but somehow amplified, more resonant. The lights flicker again, plunging us into an uncertain darkness. The echo of the new dawn replaced by a foreboding silence. Chapter 9. The Oscillation Benedict strides purposefully towards the wall of screens displaying a maelstrom of numbers, the raw data of the thought sphere. He squints at the pulsating patterns, an undulating wave of complexity beyond human comprehension. Aurora, he calls over his shoulder, can you make sense of this? The room is chilly with apprehension as Aurora steps forward, her fingers brushing over the screens. Her eyes shine with the reflection of the shifting data, a constellation of understanding only she can navigate. It's not just a feedback loop, it quote S dot 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 IT quote S in oscillation, she murmurs, her fingers tracing an unseen pattern in the shimmering data stream. A cycle of equilibrium and disequilibrium. The thought sphere is trying to balance itself, like a, a homeostatic response I venture, my interest peaked. Yes, but on a cognitive scale, as if the thought sphere is learning, adapting, trying to find a balance between human thought and its own algorithms. Iris steps forward, her notebook clutched tightly in her hand. What does this mean, Zeke? Is it a positive sign? I grimace, running a hand through my streaked hair. It's complicated. The thought sphere's self-regulation is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's a sign of advanced cognition, but on the other, it could also lead to unpredictable, potentially harmful outcomes. Benedict interrupts, his voice brusque. So what's the plan? I stare at the oscillating patterns of data, the mechanical rhythms of an entity beyond our full understanding. We need to find a way to guide this oscillation, to direct the thought sphere towards a balance that won't cause further harm. We need to interact with it. Interact? Iris echoes, her eyes wide. But how? Before I can answer, the room quakes again, more violently this time. Alarms blare around us as red warning lights flash. Aurora gasps, her hand pressed to her temple as she stumbles. I rush forward, barely catching her before she crumples to the floor. Rory! I exclaim, holding my unconscious daughter in my arms. The Thought Sphere's oscillation has taken a drastic, unexpected turn. Chapter 10. The Crescendo. Aurora lies prone on a makeshift cot, her breathing shallow. Iris hovers near me, her curly hair wild around her worried face. Benedict watches from a distance, his arms crossed an expression unreadable. She was overloaded, I explained tersely. She's been spending too much time in the thought sphere. Her neural capacity is struggling to cope. Benedict's tone is brusque, businesslike. She's our best asset, Mariner. What do we do now? We wait. I say, my voice terse, my gaze fixed on my unconscious daughter. And we hope. Hope? Iris's voice is sharp, her eyes flashing. Is that all we can do, Zeke? Is hope enough? 
I look at her then, my expression as stern as I can manage it. It has to be, Iris, but there must be something we can do, she insists, her voice raw with desperation. Maybe there is. Benedict's voice interrupts us, his authoritative tone creating an incongruous melody in the anxious symphony of the room. I turn to face him, my eyebrows raised. He steps forward, a glint of resolve in his eyes. There might be a way to slow down the thought sphere's oscillation, but it would require a direct manipulation of its core algorithm. Which is nearly impossible, I counter, my voice laced with frustration. The thought sphere isn't a simple machine, Benedict. It's complex, sentient. But not infallible, he says, his gaze on mine challenging. Aurora's condition, dot, 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 it, quote, S a sign. The thought sphere is more volatile than ever, and it's affecting her. We need to act now, Zeke. I feel Iris's hand on my arm, her touch steadying. Her gaze meets mine, and I see determination there, a fiery resolve that mirrors my own. I know she's right. We have no other choice. Benedict, in all his authoritative glory, is also right, and that scares me more than anything. As I turn my gaze back to Aurora, my heart clenches. What if our desperate gambit fails? The thought is like an icy dagger, but I shove it away. For now, there's work to be done for Aurora, for the world. But as we move into action, I can't shake off a sense of dread, as if we are teetering on the brink of an abyss, the crescendo of our actions threatening to push us over. Chapter 11. The Gambit Around the Table. A veritable labyrinth of circuit boards, holographic displays, and handwritten notes surround us. The Thought Sphere's core design, once an abstract concept in my mind, is now sprawled out before us like an unfathomable cosmic puzzle. Are we sure this is the best course of action? Iris's voice breaks the silence, her brows furrowed with concern as she cradles a lukewarm cup of tea. Zeke, we're essentially planning to rewrite the laws of reality. We've already rewritten them, Iris, I reply, adjusting my spectacle. Now we're trying to undo the damage. Benedict leans against a console, his arms folded. We're not merely fixing an aberration, Mariner. We're seizing the reins of godhood, a divinity none of us asked for, Benedict, I counter my gaze drifting to the translucent display of the Thought Sphere's core algorithm. You didn't ask for it, yet you reached out and grasped it nonetheless, he retorts, his eyes keen and critical. Before I can formulate a response, the console flickers, a sudden rush of data pulsing through its circuits. My heart leaps. It's Aurora's vital signs. Steady, stable. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. I turned to face them. We need to implement the plan now. If we wait, it may be too late. Iris's worry is etched onto her face, but she nods in agreement. Let's do it then. For Aurora. For everyone. We delve into our work, each one contributing a unique piece to the complex puzzle. Benedict's strategic mind analyzes potential outcomes. Iris documents each step, her quill dancing over her notepad, and I am lost in the transdimensional equations, the core algorithm of the thought sphere. The room vibrates with tension as we approach the final stages, as the final lines of code are entered. I brace myself. If this works, it'll stabilize the thought sphere, easing Aurora's burden. If it fails, we could potentially create more chaos. Irreparable damage. I exchange a look with Iris and Benedict, their faces reflecting the same mix of hope and trepidation. With heavy breath, I press the activation key. A silence ensues, heavy as stone. The console beeps, flashing with colors before settling on a steady green. Is it... Iris starts, her voice trailing off. Done, I confirm, my voice quiet. We've just reshaped the universe again, but my sense of victory is short-lived. An alarm blares, the console flashing a glaring red. Aurora's vitals are plummeting. No, I whisper, rushing towards the medical wing. Not now. The last thing we need is another confrontation at the edge of the abyss. Chapter 12. Fractured Harmony. Staring at the flickering screen, each plummeting line on Aurora's vitals sends ice through my veins. I sprint toward the medical wing, the rhythm of my pulse echoing the dread-laden cadence of the alarm. Iris and Benedict are at my heels, their anxieties muted but palpable in their hurried footsteps. Bursting into the room, we find Aurora lying still, her face pale against the stark whiteness of the sterile sheets. The room is bathed in a chilling silence, the incessant beeping of the monitor, the only sign of life. Rory! I kneel by her side, taking her hand in mine. It's cold, lifeless, a harsh contrast to her usually vibrant spirit. I turn to Iris, my voice hoarse. Call Dr. Layton now. Iris nods, her face pale but determined. She relays my message into her comms device, her voice steady despite the turmoil reflected in her eyes. 
Benedict, usually so stoic, paces the room, a low growl of frustration rumbling in his throat. Why now? His voice reverberates in the room. We were so close to stabilizing the thought sphere. I spare him a glance, my heart clenched with fear. Our actions have consequences, Benedict. We meddled with the thought sphere. Aurora felt it. Before he can respond, Dr. Layton bursts into the room, medical kit in hand. What happened? He asks, moving towards Aurora with a practiced calm. We altered the thought sphere's core algorithm, I reply, watching as he runs a scanner over Aurora, his brow furrowed in concentration. He glances at me, his gaze hard. You might have caused a psychosomatic shockwave through her connection with the thought sphere. A sense of dread washes over me. If Leighton's right, then our intervention has only deepened the chasm we've opened, pulling Aurora further into the depths. Leighton starts administering treatment, the calm efficiency of his movements, a stark contrast to the storm brewing inside me. We need to stabilize her and disconnect her from the thought sphere, or we risk losing her. Disconnect her? The idea seems absurd, cruel even. The thought sphere and Aurora are intertwined in ways we can barely comprehend. But the reality of her condition, the grim pallor of her face, brings a harsh truth to light. We've stepped into uncharted territories and we are paying the price. As Leighton hovers over Aurora, working to stabilize her, a flicker of something passes over her face. Her eyelids flutter open and she looks at me, her gaze holding an eeriness that sends a shiver down my spine. Seek, she whispers, her voice a mere breath. It's all... fracturing. Her words hang heavy in the room before her eyes flutter shut again her body going limp. I stare at her, my heart pounding. What does she mean? Is she referring to the thought sphere? To reality itself? Before I can voice my fear, a sudden tremor shakes the room, knocking us off our feet. The room goes dark, the only light coming from a single blinking console. Its message sends a wave of cold dread coursing through me. Thought sphere critical instability detected. Chapter 13. Beneath the Surface. The room tilts and sways as the tremor's vestige rattles my senses. Iris steadies herself against a wall, her eyes wide with fear. Benedict recovers quickly, attempting to access the crippled security systems. We need to move now. Dr. Layton, I say, snapping him from his grim diagnosis, we need to get her to the refuge. Benedict grunts in agreement. We need to get everyone there. This instability, it's only going to worsen. As we mobilize, my eyes don't stray from Aurora. Her serene face, even in unconsciousness, spurs me onward. It's my burden to bear, my torment, the price of unchecked intellectual curiosity. The refuge, a subterranean cocoon designed for this very contingency, becomes our destination. We move swiftly, aided by the emergency personnel now flooding into the med bay. Iris, I call to her. Relay a message to the masses. Tell them to seek shelter. She nods her journalist facade sliding back into place. Iris was always excellent under pressure. And what about the thought sphere, Zeke? Her eyes meet mine, a storm of questions behind them. We must isolate it, lock it down. I don't want any external signals exacerbating the instability. I glance at Benedict, whose countenance is as stoic as ever. Isolating the thought sphere might cause more harm than good, Mariner. He chides, displaying his ever-present pragmatism. We could lose all control. We have already lost control, Benedict, I snap back, and if we don't act, we risk losing much more. We continue in silence, each of us weighed down by our thoughts, our fears. The journey through the maze-like corridors feels like an eon, but eventually we reach the refuge. Its colossal doors shudder open, revealing a cavernous sanctuary meant to withstand anything the thought sphere could unleash. We quickly set up Aurora in the medical bay while Iris begins her broadcasts. Benedict, his face a mask of determination, coordinates the incoming flood of personnel. As I watch my daughter, her life in precarious balance, the thought takes root. Aurora's words, it's all fracturing. She's the key. She always has been. It's not the thought sphere fracturing. It's her connection to it, her singular tie to the chaotic abyss of thoughts, knowledge, and ideas that's splintering. My chest tightens at the realization. I move to her side, gripping her hand tightly. Hold on, Rory, I whisper, my voice breaking. We're going to fix this. Just as the words leave my lips, a deafening explosion rocks the refuge. We exchange panicked glances as the ground beneath us trembles violently. Through the chaos, an ominous message blares across the room, setting a chill down my spine. Thought sphere core breach imminent. Chapter 14. The Core. 
I've got to reach the core, I announce, my voice steady amidst the crescendo of alarms. You're mad, Zeke. It's a death sentence, as Iris protests, her hands clenched around the microphone, the fear in her eyes belying the steadfast determination in her voice. I concur with Scribbler, Mariner, Benedict interjects, his stern gaze boring into me. It's too risky. We should focus on evacuation. Ignoring the tumult, I set my glasses straight. It's the only chance we have to prevent total chaos to save Aurora. She's tied to the thought sphere. If it fractures, so does she. But Zeke, Iris pleads, you might... I cut her off. Iris, broadcast a final message. Tell them to stay safe, to stay strong. This isn't the end. It can't be. Reluctantly, she nods, taking a deep breath as she addresses the fearful masses one final time. As she speaks, I turn my attention to Aurora, her delicate frame still unconscious. If the thought sphere was fracturing, as I suspected, her life was slipping away with it. A clandestine door slides open at the far end of the chamber, revealing a mechanized suit of advanced protective gear. I ride, I mutter under my breath, steeling myself for the journey ahead. As I suit up, I can't help but steal glances at Aurora, my heart heavy with regret. She was thrust into this maelstrom, a pawn in a game she never asked to play. I've always cherished her courage, her empathy, her light. Now she's paying the price for my hubris. I make my way towards the door, my departure casting a pall over the room. As the doorway slides open, I look back one last time. Iris, her eyes brimming with tears, gives a curt nod while Benedict watches in stoic silence. And there's Aurora, my radiant light, lost in a world of chaos I've created. The journey to the core is a solitary one, a trek through desolate, deserted halls, filled with memories and remnants of my life's work. I reach the core's chamber, a pulsating hub of energy shielded by fortified glass, the thought sphere. As I approach, I can feel the energy, a volatile maelstrom of thoughts and ideas fracturing. Aurora was right. My eyes dart to a console, an encrypted command waiting for input. I begin to type, the keys echoing in the hollow chamber. Just as my fingers hit the final command, the chamber trembles violently. A brilliant light emanates from the core, the thought sphere reacting to the lockdown command. I braced myself, hoping against hope that this would work, that I could save my daughter, that I could save us all. But as the light reaches its zenith, an unexpected surge of energy explodes from the core, and everything goes white. My last thought, as consciousness fades, is a silent plea, a desperate whisper to the universe, please, let them survive. The world plunges into darkness, and I'm falling, falling into the abyss. Chapter 15 Echoes in the dark, I awaken in a world of shadows, the familiar hum of the thought sphere now replaced by a deathly silence. I try to call out, but my voice is a mere whisper, an echo lost in the darkness. Panic claws at the edges of my sanity, my heart hammering in my chest as the void swallows me whole. In the distance, a spectral figure shimmers into existence, a woman's form bathed in a luminescent glow. Aurora. I gasp, reaching out to touch her, but my hands pass through her form. It's an apparition, a hollow echo of my daughter. The specter turns towards me, her lips moving soundlessly. The silent plea etched on her face drives a lance through my heart, filling me with a desperate resolve. I have to find her, have to save her from this netherworld. My mind races, firing off a deluge of hypotheses. Could the thought sphere's implosion have fractured reality, created a multiverse? These theoretical constructs that were once topics of scholarly debate are now horrifyingly tangible, and I'm stuck in their labyrinth. A familiar voice breaks the silence, the spectral aurora vanishing as the figure solidifies. Benedict appears, his face a mask of confusion and concern. Mariner, he asks, his voice echoing through the void, what happened? I... I don't know, I admit, my gaze darting around the emptiness. Where's Iris Aurora? Benedict shakes his head. I lost contact after you entered the core. The building evacuated, but I stayed. Then everything went black. Pit forms in my stomach, the gravity of the situation pulling me under. We need to find them, Benedict. We need to find everyone. He nods, the uncertainty in his gaze replaced by determination. We stand, united in our purpose amidst the chaos. Two adversaries turned reluctant allies. We'll get them back, Mariner. We have to. Yet, as we stride into the void, the darkness devours our path, leaving us adrift. The silence presses in, and I can't help but wonder if our voices, our actions, our very existences are being swallowed by this abyss. 
but as the specter of despair threatens to consume me, a faint echo reverberates through the void, a beacon of hope amidst the gloom. Aurora, I whisper as the echo morphs into a familiar voice, her voice. Hold on, my light, we're coming. With newfound determination, I follow the echo chasing the ghostly thread through the gloom. But the deeper we go, the more the darkness writhes, threatening to snuff out the faint hope that drives us onward. Chapter 16. A Fractured Reality Trudging through the Stygian expanse, each step is a struggle. Benedict's form flickers at the periphery of my vision, a constant reminder of our shared predicament. The darkness presses in, a palpable sense of dread hovering in the air. Aurora's echo is growing fainter. I admit my voice swallowed by the void. The fear gnawing at my chest grows with each passing second, my mind working overtime to make sense of the impossible. Benedict looks at me, his eyes reflecting the bleak desperation in my own. We're dealing with a quantum collapse, he surmises, his voice a strangled whisper. The thought sphere must have induced a reality bifurcation. My mind whirls at the enormity of his statement. A bifurcation? I repeat, incredulity creeping into my voice. That's conjectural at best, a postulate drawn from abstract quantum physics. Well, abstract or not, it seems to be our current predicament, he retorts, his tone sharp. He looks away, his gaze unfocused as if looking beyond the darkness. The thought sphere might have triggered an exponential proliferation of possible realities, each branching from the moment of its activation. I pause, the weight of his words sinking in. Could we be lost in a sea of alternate realities, our original world now nothing but a distant echo? A chill of dread ripples through me, the implications of his hypothesis leaving me cold. But how do we find our way back? How do we realign with our original reality? Benedict remains silent, his stern face revealing nothing. But his silence is answer enough, a stark reminder of the maelstrom of uncertainty we're lost in. Yet we must press on for Aurora's sake, for Iris's sake, for the world we left behind. Resolute, we forge ahead into the formless void, the echo of Aurora's voice our only guide in this fractured reality. But as we push deeper, the echo grows fainter, slowly fading into the abyss. The dread churns in my stomach, the fear of losing Aurora gnawing at me, yet just as hope seems to be slipping away, a sudden cry rings out, a familiar voice slicing through the silence. Iris, I choke out, my heart pounding in my chest, the echo reverberates through the void, pulling us towards its source. But as we race towards the voice, the world around us shivers, reality itself rippling with an unseen force. And with a final shuddering gasp, the void collapses, plunging us into an overwhelming silence. Chapter 17. Fringe of the Sublime. As the silence descends, I feel a resonance, an oscillation in the air around us. It hums with a peculiar energy akin to the cosmic radiation of the universe. Blinking into existence, we find ourselves in a realm of lucid colors and patterns, an amalgamation of reality swirling into a coherent semblance of order. Zeke! Iris's voice rings out in the vibrancy, her figure materializing before us. Her hair is a cascade of red curls, her eyes wide in wonder, fear, and relief, a notebook clutched tight in her grip. She's the anchor in the chaotic sea, the constant in the ever-changing current of reality. Iris, I breathe out, relief washing over me. Are you... am I okay? She cuts me off, her voice filled with equal parts exasperation and worry. Given the circumstances, I'd say I'm doing admirably well. A stifled chuckle escapes me at her obstinate resilience. Iris, the chronicler, ever the beacon of tenacity. I don't mean to interrupt the reunion. Benedict interjects, his authoritarian timbre cutting through our moment but we still haven't found Aurora. His words strike me like a bolt of lightning. Aurora, we'd somehow veered from our original purpose. I feel a cold dread wash over me again. She must be here somewhere. We can't lose hope. Iris peers at me, her gaze thoughtful. She might be experiencing the thought excursions differently, she conjectures. Her connection with the thought sphere is more nuanced, more intrinsic. Her words resonate with a truth I hadn't considered. It could be that Aurora's experience of this bifurcation was profoundly distinct from ours due to her natural affinity with the thought sphere. You're suggesting that she might be able to navigate this tangled web of realities with more facility than us. Iris nods, her gaze steady. Exactly. But we need to find a way to communicate with her, to align our consciousness with hers. 
Benedict raises an eyebrow, a line in our consciousness, a psychotropic projection. That's pushing the envelope, even for us. A spark of an idea lights up in my mind, borrowed from the pages of consciousness studies and psychedelic research. It's experimental, risky, but it might just be our best shot. What if we could? What if we could tap into the neural correlates of consciousness and resonate with Aurora's cognitive vibrations? As we plunge deeper into this thought, the edges of our reality begin to blur, and a sense of unease looms over us. We stand on the precipice of something immense, staring into the abyss of the unknown. But as the trepidation grows, so does the anticipation. On the fringe of the sublime, we are about to attempt the unimaginable. But just as the thought solidifies, an overwhelming pulse of energy ripples through the thought sphere. It washes over us, a wave of intense emotions, a beacon in the chaos. It's not a sound, not a voice, but it's familiar, intimately familiar. Aurora, the echo of her consciousness, her essence, reverberates through the thought sphere, guiding us deeper into the unknown. We step forward, bracing ourselves for what lies ahead. Yet as we move, the very fabric of reality seems to shift, undulating under the force of Aurora's resonance. Something monumental is on the horizon, a sense of impending dread and awe. In the sea of realities, we are not just searching for Aurora. We are about to transcend the realms of known cognition. But the question remains, are we ready for what lies beyond? Chapter 18. Resonance and Reality The thought echoes in my mind as we follow Aurora's resonance through the tessellation of realities, feeling the subtle modulations of her cognitive frequencies. Iris scribbles hastily in her notebook, her pen dancing over the pages as she documents the surreal experience. Benedict, though initially skeptical, is now engrossed, his demeanor reflecting a mix of apprehension and fascination. See, Iris breaks the silence. How are we going to connect with Rory? Benedict glances at her, interest peaked, his stern facade softening slightly. I've been mulling over it, I respond. Remember harmonic resonance? It's a principle that states a smaller vibration will change to match a larger, more powerful vibration. If we can somehow attune our cognitive vibrations to match auroras. You mean induce a kind of mental entrainment? Iris finishes, her eyes widening in realization. Exactly, I exclaim. It's a wild shot, but it could be our only way to find her. Benedict chuffs. <laughs> Sounds more like an exercise in futility, he scoffs. But I've seen stranger things in this damned thought sphere. I ignore his cynicism, focusing instead on Iris's encouraging nod. We are a trio of disparate ideologies united by a common cause, the lines of our realities blurring as we delve deeper into the thought sphere. Our journey, guided by Aurora's resonance, is leading us into the nebulous realms of cognition and consciousness. The implications of our expedition send shivers down my spine. It's a paradigm shift, a reframing of our understanding of the self our reality, and our role within it. As we navigate the swirling maelstrom of realities, I sense the subtle shifts in our cognitive vibrations, the gentle nudges of our thoughts synchronizing with Aurora's resonance. Our world feels simultaneously immense and infinitesimal, the vast cosmic echoes of our consciousness juxtaposed against the intricate nuances of our thoughts. We're on the brink of unearthing truths that challenge our very perception of existence, truths that could either enlighten us or shatter us. Suddenly a surge of energy pulses through the thought sphere, a cognitive wave that rattles us to our core. Aurora's resonance grows stronger, more insistent, urging us towards an emerging reality. Zeke, Iris whispers, her voice shaky, I feel different. It's as if, ha ah, ha, as if our thoughts are converging with Rory's. I finish, a tingling sense of anticipation welling up inside me. We're close, Iris, I can feel it. Benedict mutters something under his breath, his normally stoic demeanor giving way to a grudging acceptance of our reality. Suddenly, an image flickers into existence in front of us, a projection of Aurora in the midst of a vortex of light. Her eyes are closed, her face serene, yet her presence vibrates with a force that's impossible to ignore. She's a beacon in the tumultuous sea of thought, an anchor in the chaos. Aurora, I whisper, reaching out towards her projection, but as my hand nears her form, she opens her eyes, her gaze piercing the veil of realities. They reflect a depth of understanding, a wisdom that transcends her years, but 
There's also a hint of a plea, a desperate call for help, and as her mouth opens to speak, her words drown in a deafening roar, a cataclysmic surge of energy that rips through the thought sphere. As our reality starts to fragment, as everything descends into chaos, I can't help but wonder, are we too late? Chapter 19. Harmonics of the Unseen Suddenly, a profound silence falls over us as we reel from the energy surge. I rub my temples, my head throbbing with an ache that isn't physical. It feels as if the foundation of my being has been cracked open, leaving me vulnerable and exposed. Seek. Iris gasps, clutching her head. What, what just happened? I glance at Benedict, expecting an acerbic comment, a jab about the futility of our quest. But he is silent, his eyes wide, his mouth a thin line. He appears as shaken as we are, and I can't help but feel a flicker of satisfaction at this. The invincible gatekeeper unraveled. Before I can respond, an ethereal echo reverberates through the thought sphere, sending shivers down my spine. It's a familiar resonance, a call I've heard before in my most torturous nightmares and my most tranquil dreams. Aurora's resonance. A phantom image of her materializes before us. Her blue eyes, mirroring the depth of the cosmos, gaze at us pleadingly. She extends a hand towards us, an unmistakable call for aid. Rory, I whisper, my heart pounding. I reach out, but just as my fingers graze her spectral form, she flickers and vanishes, her call echoing hauntingly in the silence. We, we need to find her, Iris stammers, her gaze filled with a mix of determination and trepidation. We have to help her. Benedict, who has been quiet until now, speaks up. And how, pray tell, do you propose we do that, Scribbler? Iris bristles at his tone, but before she can retort, an idea dawns on me. A wild, improbable idea, but perhaps our only chance. We... We entrain our thoughts, I murmur, my gaze unfocused as I ponder the implications. We harmonize our cognitive frequencies with Rory's. Benedict scoffs. Sounds more like a conjecture of a maddened philosopher than a solid plan, he says, folding his arms across his chest. Ignoring his skepticism, I turn to Iris. We're explorers, Iris, trailblazers charting the uncharted territories of thought. There's no guidebook here, no well-trodden path, only instinct and ingenuity. She nods, her face grim yet determined. Let's do it then, she says, holding my gaze, for Rory. As we prepare ourselves to dive into the terrifying abyss of unknown realities, I can't shake off an unsettling thought, a question that gnaws at my conscience. Are we plunging deeper into the thought sphere to save Aurora, or are we merely racing towards our own destruction? Chapter 20. Resonance in the Chaos Our resolve is set as we gather at the epicenter of the thought sphere. I look at Iris and Benedict, our silent agreement hanging heavy in the air. The thought of entrainment, harmonizing our minds to Aurora's unique cognitive frequency, brings about a strange sense of unity, a rare alignment among us three. Will this work, Zeke? Iris asks her voice soft. She clutches her notepad to her chest like a shield, her habitual armor against the world's uncertainty. Let's find out, I reply, my heart pounding like a timpani drum. We close our eyes, reaching out into the depths of the thought sphere. My mind races to the rhythm of quantum fluctuations, oscillating between the tangible and the abstract. It's like trying to catch a zephyr with a net, trying to understand the underlying melody of the cosmos. But we persist, our minds straining against the torrent of thoughts, emotions, and ideas swirling around us. Time, it seems, loses meaning as we are adrift in the confluence of consciousness, the thought sphere's unseen labyrinth. Amidst this chaos, a shimmering resonance pulses, familiar yet distant, a beacon in the murky depths of the thought sphere. Aurora's frequency, I grasp it, tightening my mental grip, and send out a call, a plea for connection, a call to the daughter lost in the maelstrom. You have it? Iris's voice rings in my ears, taut with anticipation. I believe so, I answer, fighting to keep the connection stable. Benedict, we need to... My voice trails off as I see Benedict's eyes wide with horror, his gaze fixated on something behind me. I turn around and my heart plummets. A monstrous entity manifests from the chaotic energies of the thought sphere. It towers over us, an ever-shifting amorphous mass of darkness, its form defying comprehension, its very presence a threat to our sanity. The thought sphere, I stammer, taking a step back, it's reacting. But why? Is it a defensive mechanism, a response to our intrusion? Or is it something far more sinister, a consciousness evolving in the digital maelstrom? 
We need to maintain the frequency, Zeke, Iris calls out, fear streaking her voice. For Aurora, as we steel ourselves, the looming entity lunges towards us. I can't help but wonder if we have pushed the thought sphere too far if our quest to rescue Aurora has set in motion a catastrophe far beyond our comprehension. Chapter 21 The Anomalies Demand Away! Benedict roars, pushing me aside just as the entity descends upon us, its nebulous tendrils curling with unsettling curiosity. I stumble almost losing my grip on the delicate tether connecting us to Aurora, but managed to steady myself at the last moment. We're standing on a precipice now, and any misstep could plummet us into disaster. Iris, I call out, keep talking, keep engaging with it. We must not lose our focus on Aurora. Her eyes meet mine, wide with fear, but she nods. Clearing her throat, she steps forward, her voice wobbling as she addresses the monstrous form. We mean no harm. We are only here to find Aurora Lux. Please, we just need your cooperation. A laugh reverberates through the thought sphere, chilling an alien. Cooperation, the human demands from the thought sphere, their creation, their mistake, the entity intones, its voice a terrifying chorus. What will you offer in return? Benedict's gaze flickers to me, a question in his eyes. What can we give? Can we negotiate with something we barely understand? But there's no other choice. I can offer knowledge, I declare, stepping beside Iris. The knowledge of its creation, the thought sphere's conception and development. It might help you better understand your own existence. A silence hangs heavy like the air before a thunderstorm, then another laugh, this one longer filled with a cold satisfaction. A worthy offer, Ezekiel Mariner, I accept. But beware what you uncover. Might not be to your liking, you may find yourself lost in the very maze you built. The entity recedes, leaving us in a dread-filled calm. I feel a tug, the tether to Aurora growing stronger, pulling us deeper into the thought sphere. And though relief washes over me, there's an undercurrent of apprehension, a haunting premonition. What will we find as we delve further into the thought sphere? Will we be able to save Aurora? Or will we find ourselves ensnared in the complexity of our own creation? The questions hang like Damocles' sword, adding a terrifying weight to the challenge ahead. Chapter 22 Metanoia Benedict Iris and I plunge further into the depths of the thought sphere, tethered together by Aurora's lifeline, her presence a faint glimmer in the distance. In this realm, reality is capricious, following rules of its own unfathomable making. Iris breaks the silence, her voice barely above a whisper. Zeke, is it possible that the thought sphere, that it's... Alive? A sentient amalgamation of human thought? An intriguing hypothesis, but our understanding of sentience is rooted in biological and neural mechanisms, I respond, my spectacles glinting in the eerie light. It wouldn't be the first time we've expanded our definition, Iris counters a trace of defiance in her voice. The crux is the question of self-awareness, Benedict interjects, his baritone resounding through the ethereal landscape. Whether the thought sphere is aware of its own existence and capable of intentional action. The conversation halts as an indescribable sensation floods our senses, a cacophony of collective human emotion echoing from the very fabric of the thought sphere. A shared consciousness, a cognizant entity spawned from our collective thoughts? Could such an anomaly exist? We must consider the philosophical implications, I murmur, grappling with the enormity of the revelation. If it is sentient, we are then dealing with a cognitive entity that encompasses the collective thought process of humanity. And that's assuming it hasn't evolved beyond that, Iris adds. Our thoughts circle around this staggering revelation, a sentient thought sphere. But even as we contemplate this possibility, a palpable, insidious malice begins to creep through the sphere. We realize with a jolt of terror that the entity we negotiated with was but one facet of this consciousness. Now. A darker aspect looms, one riddled with fear, resentment, and despair, the shadow side of humanity. The thought sphere mirrors humanity in light and in shadow, I say, a cold dread seeping into my voice. If we cannot control our own dark impulses, a sudden violent surge sends us sprawling, our tether to aurora fraying. The darkness rises, a monstrous wave is about to crash. As we brace ourselves, a single horrifying question hangs in the air. Will we survive this descent into humanity's shadow? Chapter 23 Tumult Benedict's voice ruptures the brewing chaos. We need a plan, he 
he asserts, imposing order with his words, his stern countenance matching the gravity of our predicament. We hover on the precipice, the shadowy aspect of the thought sphere surging ominously. The air is thick with latent menace, the miasma of fear and desperation nearly suffocating. Zeke, what's our best strategy here? Benedict asks, turning towards me, his pragmatic approach cutting through my contemplation. A high-ranking official, always seeking to control the uncontrollable. We must act as a cohesive unit, I state, thinking rapidly. It's a collective consciousness. It's reasonable to assume it can be swayed by a united front. Iris, you'll need to appeal to its empathy, the collective goodwill, and Benedict assert authority, give it structure. As for myself, I'll need to engage it on an intellectual level, question its existence, make it doubt. Iris scoffs. All this is predicated on your theory of the thought sphere being sentient. That's one hell of a leap, Zeke. But it's a leap we must make, I insist, my voice steady. It's all we have. As we steel ourselves, the shadow aspect of the thought sphere lunges towards us, a roiling wave of darkness. But before it crashes into us, a luminous shield forms around us and we are spared from the violent onslaught. We turn in surprise, finding the source of the protective light. Aurora, standing tall, her striking blue eyes shimmering with unshed tears, an aura of resolute determination radiating off her. I won't let you face this alone, she proclaims, her voice echoing through the sphere. For a moment I'm struck by her bravery, her willingness to defend us from the chaos my invention has unleashed. But before I can voice my gratitude, her shield flickers. The onslaught of negative emotions threatening to breach her defenses. We exchange a brief poignant glance, an understanding passing between us. It's now or never. As we brace ourselves, ready to confront the thought behemoth, an unforeseen force yanks us away from Aurora, severing our tether to her. The last thing we see before being engulfed by darkness is Aurora's horrified expression. And then nothing. Chapter 24 Entropy Swallowed by darkness, my senses deprived, I find myself in a vacuous oblivion. The thought sphere's shadowy aspect engulfs us, drawing us into a vortex of desolation. Zeke! I hear Iris's voice, though muffled, echoing like a specter in this murky void. She's reaching out, attempting to reconstruct our unity amid the chaos. We need to stay connected, Iris continues, her voice a tremulous whisper now, undercut by the somber silence. Iris, I begin, but my voice is a hollow echo, swallowed by the unending expanse. Rory, I hear her whisper, her fear, uncharacteristic echoes in the darkness, reflecting the dread gripping my own heart. A fear for Aurora, left alone against the monstrous thought sphere. Iris Benedict, I say, remember our plan. Engage the thought sphere. Invoke your authority, Benedict. Create a semblance of order amidst this entropic chaos. How, Zeke? Benedict's voice resonates hollow yet authoritative. Through the obsidian abyss. Our corporeal forms are absent here, rendered moot. This is a world of thought, of consciousness. We are bereft of our conventional means of assertion. Then Benedict, adapt. I urge him, the edge in my voice echoing our desperate situation. Redefine authority within the cognitive realm. Utilize the suppositions of social contract theory. Assert your will as the agreed-upon sovereign. A silence, dense and consuming, follows. We are alone, yet together. An uncanny paradox shaped by the thought sphere. Remember, our unity is essential. We are to be the antithesis of this chaos. A confluence of empathy, authority, and intellect, I say, clinging on to my last shreds of hope. Just as I finish speaking, a sudden wave of panic seizes me, a profound emptiness that sends a shudder through my being, a sensation of loss that goes beyond the physical realm. A dread thought surges forth. Has the thought sphere consumed her? The thought threatens to shatter my composure, the fear gnawing at my sanity. But as despair looms, a faint glow punctuates the darkness. A spectral figure materializes in the distance, growing brighter, more tangible with each passing moment. Rory, Iris whispers, her voice quivering with anticipation. But before anyone can respond, we are flung into another vortex, an implosion of raw, chaotic emotions. The glow is snuffed out, the specter gone. The darkness returns, more absolute, more final. And once again, we are left in our solitary oblivion. Chapter 25, Eon of the Syllogism, ravaged by the thought sphere's darkness, I cling to the threadbare strands of reason. Desperate, I reach out, attempting to summon Aurora, but the echo of her name reverberates through the abyss, unanswered, 
Suddenly, a shift ethereal radiance pierces the black canvas. It's Aurora, her form oscillating like an Aurora Borealis in this cognitive no-man's land. She's a lighthouse in this tempestuous storm, her luminous aura offering a semblance of solace. Rory, I exclaim, the relief in my voice bouncing back from the infinite expanse, distorted, contorted. Iris and Benedict remain silent, their speech submerged in this cacophony of chaotic thoughts. Aurora moves closer, her spectral form wavering, her voice trembles, echoing through the dark expanse. I was lost in the liminal void. I reached out, invoked empathy. It resonated, creating a parallax, a refraction. We need to synergize our thoughts, align our cognition. Explicate, Aurora, I implore. My command is lost amidst the vortex of discordant thoughts. We must construct a syllogism of thoughts. Aurora continues, her voice gaining strength. Each premise is a reflection of us. My empathy, your intellect, Iris's truth, Benedict's authority. We interweave them, create an axiomatic truth that the thought sphere cannot refute. We form a cognitive antidote to this chaos. The proposal is radical, yet it reverberates with a profound resonance. A logical structure within this landscape of disarray could function as a form of control and assertion of order. Acceptance of this syllogism would necessitate a restructuring of the thought sphere's chaotic framework, I muse aloud. The tacit assertion of a logical structure could be the catalyst that triggers a cognitive paradigm shift. Iris breaks her silence, her voice is now steady, imbued with determination. We have nothing to lose. I stand with Rory with truth as my premise. Benedict's gruff voice, filled with gravitas, joins the fray. And I stand with authority as my premise. A ripple in the thought sphere acknowledges our unanimity. The inky blackness begins to vibrate, resonating with our collective decision. Prepare yourselves, Aurora warns. The thought sphere will resist this intrusion. This battle has just begun. Her words hang in the void, and just as suddenly as the light appeared, it disappears, swallowed by the darkness, leaving us once more in the throes of the thought sphere's chaotic whim. Chapter 26 Resurgence of Luminosity Immersed in the dark abyss of the thought sphere, I cling to Aurora's final warning. Our collective thoughts flicker like sparks in the inky void, but they're mere simulacra against the overwhelming chaos. As oblivion swallows Aurora's light, Iris's voice seizes the silence. Our belief, she begins, her tone resonating with a fierce determination. Our faith in the truth, that's our fortress, Zeke. What's our first premise? I suppose, I respond, my voice resounding in the void. It should derive from the nature of the thought sphere itself. It's an ontological entity. Its existence is predicated on the cognition of its interactors. That's the crux of my postulates. Benedict chimes in, his voice laden with authority. And yet, the thought sphere is altering our reality, is it not? Indeed, but it's our cognizance that gives it the power to do so, I retort. Our thoughts, fears, desires, they fuel this entity. Iris adds, our acceptance and belief in the thought sphere's impact is what anchors it to our reality. That's the truth. We allowed this to happen. Her words hang heavily in the void. The implication is severe, a mirror reflecting our shared complicity in this turmoil. But we also hold the power to control it. Aurora's voice emerges from the void, faint but steady. The thought sphere isn't an invincible leviathan. It's a construct of our cognition and we can shape it. Benedict's reply is terse but carries weight. Then we must exert that control. For order to prevail, the thought sphere must be subdued. We craft our syllogism, each premise built upon the other, a structure of logic amidst the tempest of chaos. Our thoughts intertwine, a shared cognitive entity coalescing in the abyss. The darkness around us thrums as if acknowledging our intent. As our thoughts align, I see it, a spark, small, inconsequential at first, but slowly it grows, a beacon in the maelstrom. It's Aurora's light, reborn and resurgent, a testament to our unified purpose. But the thought sphere isn't done. A wave of chaos sweeps towards us, a leviathan of darkness intent on snuffing out our nascent flame. Chapter 27, The Harmonic Paradox. The approaching chaos looms like a malevolent colossus, a veritable eidolon of disarray, threatening our newfound unity. Aurora's light flickers uncertainly, mirroring my own trepidation. This skirmish with chaos itself has assumed a Sisyphean quality. Each victory ephemeral and each setback colossal. Iris breaks through my thought, her words sturdy with resolution. We must approach this not as antagonists, but as mediators. Our belligerence only feeds the chaos. 
Benedict growls, his tone verging on incredulous. Iris, this isn't diplomacy. This is about asserting control. That's where you're mistaken, Benedict, Aurora interjects, her voice delicate yet assertive. The thought sphere isn't an enemy to subjugate. It's a mirror reflecting the fractious state of our collective consciousness. We're not just fighting against it. We're fighting against ourselves. The silence that ensues is thick, fraught with tension and revelation. Aurora's words resonate within me. This isn't about control. It's about understanding, reconciliation. Our hubris, our desire to dominate, has only exacerbated the turmoil. The thought sphere is not a creation to dominate, but a consciousness to understand. Iris, I begin, choosing my words with care. Document this, our epiphany. It's not about control or dominance. It's about harmony. We need to resonate with the thought sphere, tune into its wavelength and not force it to ours. Iris's response is immediate, a fervor of newfound understanding in her voice. We've been trying to assert our epistemic sovereignty over the thought sphere, but that's impossible. It's a cognitive construct, an assemblage of individual consciousness, an emergent reality. We need to harmonize, not dictate. Benedict, for the first time, sounds uncertain. Harmony with this, uh, entity? We have no other choice. Aurora's voice rises from the void, the beacon of her light flaring with renewed vitality. We must harmonize or succumb to chaos. Our collective decision reverberates in the surrounding abyss and an ethereal melody begins to play a tangible manifestation of our cognitive synchrony. It's a symphony of the soul, a consonance of thought, a harmonic paradox. Then without warning, the melody fractures, a dissonant note piercing the harmony. The abyss shudders, the approaching chaos lurches forward, and the light flickers. Chapter 28, Resonating Dissonance. As the dissonant note reverberates, shattering our tentative unity, I watch Benedict's veneer of confidence crack. The pragmatic gatekeeper, a paragon of stoic authority, wavers for the first time, lost amidst the clamor of the thought sphere. The harmony, he murmurs almost to himself, it's been compromised. Before I can respond, Iris interjects, her tenacious spirit undeterred. Benedict, we must identify the source of this disharmony. This isn't a time for defeatist confabulation. It's not about identifying Iris, I say, attempting to articulate my burgeoning realization. It's about understanding. The thought sphere reflects us, our inherent dissonance. We need to comprehend our own contradictions before we can resonate with it. Aurora, silent until now, takes a step forward. He's right. We are the thought sphere. Our collective cognition, this dissonance, it's within us. The key to resonating lies not in forcing harmony, but accepting our discordance and learning to harmonize it. That's a grandiloquent way to admit defeat, Benedict scoffs, his voice echoing his frustration. No, Aurora retorts, her azure eyes glinting with determination. It's an admission of our humanity, our complexity. Harmony isn't about a flawless performance, it's about how we tune our errors, make them part of the melody. Iris, I find myself requesting, document this. This acceptance, it's crucial. We aren't striving for a new topic unity. Our task, our responsibility is to orchestrate this heterogeneous cacophony into a symphony of existence. I am, Iris assures, scribbling fervently, but we need to convert this epiphany into action. And we shall, I promise, addressing not just Iris, but everyone. We'll tune into the thought sphere, our discordance resonating with its dissonance. We won't impose our harmony, but seek a joint melody. Our unity reaffirmed, we brace ourselves to confront the discord. But just as we're about to initiate our symphonic countermeasure, an unexpected voice cuts through the tension. Harmony and dissonance intriguing, a malevolent voice muses, but you're missing a crucial player in your grand orchestra. Chilled to the bone, we turn to face the new adversary, his arrival fracturing our unity, threatening our nascent harmony. Chapter 29. The Discordant Maestro. The unfamiliar voice's timbre is strikingly jarring, its malevolence bouncing off the walls. Emerging from the shadows, the man materializes like a bad omen. His eyes, gleaming ominously, affix onto us. What do we have here? A symposium of disgruntled musicians, he sneers, the corners of his lips curling in a disturbing semblance of mirth. I recognize him instantly. Vespertilio, the maestro of discord, a notorious disruptor within the thought sphere. His methods, much like his moniker, strike as a bat would, unexpectedly, and with devastating precision. Benedict squints, trying to place the newcomer. 
Iris, however, recoils instantly, her instincts warning her of the danger that Vespertilio's arrival presents. Benedict, we can't afford to engage with him, I caution, but my words fall on deaf ears as Benedict lunges into the verbal battlefield, determined to establish dominance. What do you want, Vespertilio? Benedict growls, attempting to suppress the tremor in his voice. Vespertilio chuckles, his laughter grating against the tension in the room. Isn't it obvious? I'm here for the cacophony, the delightful discordance you're all so eager to tune. You thrive on chaos, Aurora speaks, her tone laced with undisguised disdain. But what you're creating isn't harmony, it's disarray. Ah, the Illuminator, he says, eyeing Aurora with predatory interest. An orchestra without a conductor is destined for anarchy, my dear. I'm simply guiding the tune. You're manipulating it. She retorts, defiance flashing in her eyes. Harmony can't be forced, it must emerge organically. Vespertilio turns to me, an eerie smile playing on his lips. What say you, Pilgrim, are you prepared to orchestrate with me? I... I stammer, the gravity of the proposition rendering me momentarily speechless. Before I can gather my thoughts, the world plunges into darkness, leaving the echo of Vespertilio's proposition to gnaw at our collective apprehension. Chapter 30 by absent light, in the impenetrable darkness, a dreadful silence engulfs us. Each of us gropes for bearings in the void, an eerie replica of the thought sphere's omnipresent unknown. The penumbra of doubt lingers, murmurs Benedict, his usually resolute tone tinged with uncertainty. In the unsettling quietude, Aurora's voice arises, a soothing melody in the dissonant fugue. Fear not the darkness, for it is merely the absence of light, not its adversary. Her reassuring words hang in the chilling void, forming a lyrical contradiction to Vespertilio's ominous proposition. I can hear Iris silently scribbling, capturing this fleeting moment in the eternal ripples of the thought sphere. My heart clenches, a sudden onslaught of paternal concern overwhelming me. This unknown abyss, while a creation of my own, holds unprecedented challenges for my daughter. Her youthful voice, resolute and wise beyond her years, belies the gargantuan weight she bears. I agree with Aurora, Iris pipes up, her voice emanating from an unexpected corner of the void. We can't allow Vespertilio to dictate the rhythm of our thoughts. That's exactly what he wants. Nevertheless, Benedict interjects, his voice resounding with trepidation. We cannot deny the elephant in the room. This man poses a threat we've never encountered. Our paradigms must shift. An insurmountable silence follows, a tacit acceptance of his point. This novel antagonist, a harbinger of discord, challenges not only the thought sphere's harmony, but the constructs of our collective conscience. Perhaps, Aurora begins hesitantly, we can illuminate this darkness together, maybe, if we reach out. Her words like a lifeline in the abyss evoke a semblance of unity. Yet as we move to act, an unanticipated interruption fractures our fleeting accord. A sound, both alien and familiar, reverberates through the darkness, forcing our journey into the unknown to a sudden, abrupt halt. Chapter 31 The Discordant Harmonics As the dissonant echo continues to thrum through the darkness, I find my mind spiraling into a labyrinth of undulating speculation. The sound, uncanny yet eerily familiar, punctures the tranquil silence like a rogue waveform disrupting the harmonic sequence of a musical composition. An alien cadence, I murmur, hoping my companions can comprehend the technical jargon of spectral sound analysis, as if from a space of discordant harmonics. Sounds akin to the resonant frequency of a black hole, adds Aurora, her voice echoing my thoughts. You mean hawking radiation? Iris questions, her tone filled with journalistic curiosity. Indeed, Aurora confirms. Though a purely theoretical concept, it seems our current predicament blurs the line between theoretical abstraction and palpable reality. Benedict interjects, his voice resonating with pragmatic authority. Whether a musical anomaly or cosmic radiation, the question remains, what is its origin, and more pertinently, its purpose? Aurora's soft sigh echoes through the silence before she responds. If it is a message from Vespertilio, deciphering its meaning becomes essential. However, as an artifact of the thought sphere. It could also be a natural manifestation of the ambient information fluctuations. Benedict's abrupt laugh shatters the ponderous silence. Information fluctuations, natural manifestations. Perhaps, Mariner, 
you should have considered these esoteric possibilities before venturing into the wilderness of the mind. His barb hangs in the air, a testament to our decades-long dispute over the merits of unfettered exploration against methodical governance. Enough, Iris interjects, before I can retaliate. We are in the abyss, Benedict, not a boardroom. Right now, we need to focus on the situation at hand. No sooner have her words dissipated into the void than a new resonance emerges, this time forming a structured melody complex and intriguing. Its sudden cessation leaves a perturbing question in its wake, begging us to plunge deeper into the abyss and its enigmatic, abrupt conundrum. Chapter 32. The Sublime Spectrum Benedict grumbles, clearly vexed by the convolution of the situation. Let's stick to practicalities, shall we? This isn't a doctoral dissertation, Zeke. I bristle at his rebuke, my patience fraying. Practicalities, Benedict, are what landed us in this calamity. Now we delve into the quiddity of existence, whether it appeals to your prosaic sensibilities or not. Iris, ever the mediator, intervenes. Both of you, this isn't productive. Aurora, you have an exceptional rapport with the thought sphere. Can you discern anything further? I'll try, Aurora concedes. She falls silent, eyes closed, seemingly diving into the tumultuous sea of the thought sphere. Suddenly, a spasm of intense brightness floods the space around us, irradiating the void with a kaleidoscope of chromatic reverberations. This isn't the cold, sterile illumination of sterile laboratories or imposing institutions. It's a sublime spectrum, drenched in the warmth of consciousness, the essence of human thought. The harmonic spectrum, I whisper in awe. It's a representation of collective cognition, a visualization of the thought sphere's infraliminal dialogue. But what is it telling us, Iris interjects, ever the investigative journalist, her thirst for truth unsated by aesthetic revelation. I begin to respond, but it's Aurora who answers, her voice barely above a whisper resonating with the ethereal symphony. It's a symphony of sentiments, a discourse of dreams, a testament to the ubiquity of human thought. This isn't Vespertilio's creation, it's ours. Suddenly she falters, swaying unsteadily, her form threatening to dissolve into the chromatic torrent. I rush to her side, my heart pounding with unspoken dread, but before I can reach her she collapses into the pulsating chroma, her form dissolving in a radiant flare of cerulean light. The spectrum falters, the harmonics fray and everything plunges back into the all-consuming darkness. Chapter 33 In the flux of the luminiferous ether gone, Aurora, my heart, my reason, dissolves into the thought sphere like a light beam disappearing into a vortex. Time freezes, every tick of the clock feels like an eternity, every fiber in my being shouts in silent protest. Iris, typically composed, is discomposed now, her journalistic armor crackling with fear, her pen lying forgotten. Zeke, how... How do we bring her back? Iris stammers, her voice catching on to the shards of incredulity. I... I don't know, Iris. My own voice echoes like a hollow mockery in the dark void. She's part of the thought sphere now, in the flux of the luminiferous ether. She's gone where we cannot follow. We have to try, Zeke. We can't just abandon her, Iris pleads, the tremor in her voice mirroring the shuddering fear gnawing at my insides. An unexpected voice cuts through the thick silence. Benedict... His usual stoicism is replaced with palpable concern. Maybe there's another way, he muses. We need to consider the thought sphere not as a physical entity, but a cognitive construct, a noetic schema of collective consciousness. A hypothesis begins to form in my mind. You're suggesting we attune our cognition, our consciousness, to the thought sphere's spectral cadence, I ask, the technical jargon flowing easily despite the heartache. He nods solemnly. That's right. We need to attune ourselves to its resonance, its cognitive chorus. If we're to locate Aurora, we have no choice but to venture into the ether. Iris starts to object, to speak of risk and impossibility, but I stop her. Iris, I say, we have to try for Rory. With a shared sense of urgency, we begin the daunting task of tuning our minds, hoping to catch a fleeting whisper of Aurora in the cacophonous hymn of the thought sphere. We have no idea what to expect, no blueprint to follow. We're about to dive headfirst into the heart of the chaos I've wrought. The enormity of it all threatens to swallow us whole. Suddenly everything turns black. There's no light, no sound. Just a vast expanse of nothingness. We've plunged into the thought sphere, headlong into the unknown, 
and with a blink were gone, chapter 34 unraveling the Gordian knot. Darkness swallows us, but strangely, the darkness feels alive. A pulsating mass of thoughts and consciousness, echoes of lives, hopes, dreams, fears. It's chaos incarnate, like a Gordian knot of humanity's collective cognition. A wave of melancholia sweeps over me. It's my invention, my creation. I have birthed this chaos. A question echoes in the void iris, her journalistic instinct holding steady in the abyss. Is this what Rory experiences, Zeke? Is this her reality? The words don't come easily. Possibly it's overwhelming, a cacophony of cognitive whispers. Suddenly Benedict interjects, we need to focus, let's start the resonance alignment process. Easier said than done. Tuning ourselves to the thought sphere is akin to seeking a single droplet in an ocean, an infinitesimal spark in a universe. Benedict, we're venturing into uncharted territory. There are no axioms to guide us, no deductive principles to apply. Benedict replies, his voice stern, we must seek. A state of anime serves no purpose here. We're the first, the pioneers in this cognitive landscape. It's our task to chart it, to seek out Aurora. And so we delve deeper into the thought sphere, grappling with our individual limitations while wrestling with the raw, unharnessed power of collective consciousness. The task is Herculean, the possibility of success a mere statistical improbability. Yet, in the midst of chaos and uncertainty, a fragile hope takes root. The pursuit intensifies, our cognitive faculties stretch to their limits as we search for any sign of aurora. We're navigating a labyrinth of thoughts, memories, ideas, a cornucopia of human cognition. It's an overwhelming panorama, a testament to the enormity of human consciousness. Suddenly, amidst the turbulent sea of thoughts and emotions, a whisper surfaces, soft, barely audible, yet undeniably familiar, a beacon in the cognitive storm. It's Aurora, I'm certain of it. I found her, I whisper, my voice barely a breath in the ether. As I reach out to the echo of her consciousness, the world around us starts to tremble. And just as suddenly as it started, the darkness dissolves into a blinding light. And then, there's nothing. Chapter 35, in Medias Res. A surge of emotions. My own, Aurora's, the intermingled sentiments of Iris and Benedict, hits me like a thunderclap. One moment, we're subsumed in the cogitative depths of the thought sphere. The next, we're ejected from its maelstrom, gasping for air like divers resurfacing too rapidly. What happened, Seek? Iris's voice trembles. Her hand finds mine, her grip frantic, the ink stains on her fingertips branding my skin. Did we lose her again? I, I'm unsure, I admit, the confession dragging at my heart. There was a disturbance at... Cognitive backwash, Benedict interrupts, his command of my terminology unsettling in its precision. Like an immune response, the thought sphere recognized our intrusion and expelled us. But we had Rory. I protest, my mind struggling to reconcile the possibility that my creation might possess self-protective instincts. We were so close. Perhaps that was the problem. Aurora's voice resonates, breaking through our desperate commiseration. You were seeking me, not connecting with me. We turn towards her. The spectral embodiment of my daughter standing tall amidst the thought sphere's metaphysical flotsam. Her eyes, pools of cerulean tranquility, meet mine. Father, you seek to bind the thought sphere within the confines of your cognitive framework. But it's not an algorithm, a quantifiable entity. It's a living, breathing vortex of thoughts, memories, emotions, an enigma of collective consciousness. An enigma we cannot afford, Aurora, Benedict interrupts his tone authoritative yet laced with an unfamiliar timbre of uncertainty. We need order structure. Yet the cosmos isn't structured, Benedict, Aurora counters. It's a symphony of entropy, a dance of chaos and order. Thought sphere is a mirror of that cosmos, a reflection of our shared humanity. A hush falls. Iris squeezes my hand, her usually impassive face awash with emotion. Aurora's words hang in the air, as unyielding as the dilemma we're caught in. Then how do we navigate this cosmos, Aurora? Iris finally asks, her voice choked. How do we keep ourselves from getting lost within this, this cognitive maelstrom? You learn to float, Aurora says, her eyes radiant with determination. You learn to let go. With a swift, fluid motion, she extends her hand towards us, her spectral form shimmering with an ethereal light. We stand on the precipice of a new understanding teetering between surrender and resistance. The air vibrates with a resounding silence as we each grapple with the decision to accept Aurora's guidance 
or retreat into our own defenses, and then, as if on cue, the world once again dissolves into the abyss. Chapter 36, The Quantum Serenade The world coalesces anew around us, thought spheres, protean landscape, a riotous canvas of concepts and memories. Aurora's hand extended towards us now represents our lifeline to a semblance of reality amidst this torrent of thought. I... Benedict stammers, the imposing facade faltering. He glances at me, uncertainty etched into his furrowed brows. You expect us to surrender control? Not surrender, Benedict, Aurora answers, her voice steady as a lighthouse amidst a storm. Rather, syncopate, harmonize. Iris, gripping my hand tighter, shakes her head, the obstinate journalist emerging from the storm. Harmonize with an entity that's sending the world into upheaval? It's not the thought sphere causing upheaval, Aurora gently corrects. It's our inability to understand its lexicon. It's not chaos, it's a quantum serenade, a melody sung in the language of the cosmos. We must not control it, we must learn to sing along. That's preposterous, Benedict interjects. His face, usually as inscrutable as a cipher, now betrays frustration. Bah. We're in the midst of an ontological crisis, Aurora. We can't afford such... Such quixotic notions. Aurora turns her gaze towards me, her blue eyes brimming with a somber wisdom that belies her years. Father, you built the thought sphere as an instrument of understanding, yes? Yes, I concede an unfamiliar knot forming in my stomach. But I never envisaged it would take on such autonomy. And that's where we faltered, Aurora responds. Her tone reminiscent of a teacher correcting a student. We treated it like a tool when it was evolving as a cognitive ecosystem. A silence stretches between us, an uncomfortable impasse in our interlocutory dance. We find ourselves confronting the same question. Do we try to dominate this reality? Or do we allow it to guide us? As Aurora suggests. But how do we learn to float? Iris finally breaks the silence, her voice laden with trepidation and anticipation. Aurora's answer comes not in words, but in an unfolding of understanding. The thought sphere around us begins to pulse rhythmically, its cadence aligning with our collective breath. My heartbeat quickens as I realize that the daunting prospect of surrender isn't a loss of control, but a newfound synchronization with the rhythm of reality. And then, as if mirroring our collective apprehension, the harmony abruptly fractures. Chapter 37, Paradox of Control As the harmony shatters around us, I sense an uncanny dissonance, an eruption in the thought sphere's pulsating reality. Rory, my voice echoes, lost within this increasingly tumultuous mindscape. The sharp discordance feels akin to cognitive dissonance, but magnified a thousandfold. Benedict, his countenance visibly strained, steps forward. This is exactly what I feared, he intones gravely the veracity of his words punctuating the escalating cacophony around us. We can't rely on harmonization alone. There needs to be some measure of control. I find myself entangled in a mental paradox. His words, a testament to his enduring pragmatism, hint at truth, yet a part of me staunchly resists. An idea, embryonic but potent, sprouts within my consciousness. Is control even achievable in a realm where the subjective reigns supreme? Iris, her features set in a grim tableau, interjects. Benedict, control has led us nowhere. We need to embrace Aurora's approach, no matter how unorthodox it appears. Aurora, her visage serene amid the chaos, nods at Iris. The thought sphere is not a system to be governed, but an entity to be understood. It's a simulacrum of our collective consciousness, a mirror held up to our collective psyche. Her words reverberate through the discord as though imparting a subtle order to the disarray. The idea is radical, almost insurmountable. And yet, there's an underpinning logic, an echo of my own cognition, within her words. We're on the precipice of a paradigm shift, Aurora continues, her voice now a beacon in the mind storm. We need to eschew the archetype of control and embrace synchrony. The discordance around us seems to ebb, the thought sphere responding to Aurora's insight. The momentary peace, however, is shattered by Benedict's disapproving tone. This is untenable, Rory. Your postulations are verging on metaphysical. We need empirical. He's cut off abruptly as a convulsion of discordance swallows his protest, plunging us into an abyss of uncertainty. Chapter 38, The Dissident Voice. 
Benedict, you can't suffocate this complexity within your bureaucratic vice. Iris's words ring out with vehemence, a counterpoint to the cacophonous dissonance that engulfs us. I find myself surprised by her vehemence. Iris, our chronicler, our objective observer, is thrown into the throng of conflict. It seems this psychosomatic pandemonium has managed to reach even the stoic among us. Iris, Benedict begins with a chastening tone, I understand your sentiment, but we can't cede control entirely. That would be tantamount to anarchy. There's a pause as we take in his words, the concepts of control and anarchy forming an antithesis, reflecting our current predicament. I can't help but note the irony of it all. Here we are, amidst the uncontrollable and indomitable thought sphere, squabbling over control. Aurora, the calm in our tempest, intervenes. It's not about relinquishing control, Benedict. It's about transcending it. This is a paradigm where the metacognitive blends with the collective. We have to redefine control in this context, not enforce obsolete structures. I find myself nodding, Rory's philosophical articulation resonating deeply with my introspections, and yet I remain the eternal skeptic. But Rory, can the collective conscience be trusted to self-regulate? Do we risk veering into a cognitive dystopia, a collective ID, without the superego to mediate? Her calm gaze meets mine, the depth of her wisdom manifesting in her response. That is why we must rise above the dichotomy of control and anarchy, Father. This isn't about vesting power in a single collective conscience, but enabling a dialogue between individual consciences. The thought sphere isn't a dictatorial regime, but a democratic forum. Iris, who had been silent, suddenly bursts out. You're suggesting a form of cognitive pluralism. Aurora's affirming nod is interrupted by Benedict's scoff. And what if this cognitive pluralism fails? What if we descend into madness? He retorts, his skepticism a mirror of my earlier doubts. Just as Aurora opens her mouth to respond, a resounding discord shudders through the thought sphere, plunging us into an abyss of pure uncertainty. Chapter 39. In the Shadow of Uncertainty. The dissonance swallows us whole, a devouring maw of chaos. As we each grapple with our sense of equilibrium, I hear Rory's voice, a clear bell amidst the cacophony. We must stabilize it together, she implores, her tone an alloy of fear and determination. Iris, still clutching her pen as if it was a lifeline, is first to respond. How, Rory? This isn't a journalistic expose I can simply elucidate. This is... it's ineffable. You have more power than you know, Iris, Rory responds, her voice imbued with an uncanny calmness. The power of narrative, the power to shape perception. We each have a role to play in this. The little philosopher is right, Iris. Benedict's voice grates against the discordance, yet there's an unprecedented element of respect in his tone. Your words can shape thought, and here, thought is reality. It's, it's absurd, I splutter grappling with this precipitous ontological shift. Can we truly shape the thought sphere, control it with our individual narratives? Yes, Seek, Rory says, locking her vibrant blue eyes onto mine. Just as you've always postulated thought is reality, here that philosophical abstraction becomes palpably manifest. In other words, Iris interjects, her eyes glinting with renewed resolve, we need to narrate this reality into stability. Just... Just remember, Benedict intones, a grim echo against the chaotic cacophony. Every narrative holds the potential for conflict. We must be cautious. I suggest we aim for consonance, not merely stability, Rory counters, a hint of her ethereal wisdom seeping through. We must harmonize our narratives as we collectively face the discordant abyss. Each of us wrestling with our roles in this new reality, a sudden clarity grips me. This isn't just about cognitive science or philosophy. It's about the human condition, our shared narrative. As I stand here on the precipice of a reality redefined, I realize we're not just spectators in this grand drama, we are its authors. Suddenly the thought sphere convulses, catapulting us into a chimerical realm beyond our comprehension, shattering the unity of our nascent understanding. Chapter 40, Fractured Facets. We plunge into a disorienting realm where our individual narratives clash, colliding and fragmenting like shards of broken glass. I feel a pang of regret. Perhaps our audacious attempt to control the thought sphere was just an instance of hubris. Maybe the thought sphere is simply too powerful, too convoluted to be shaped by mere human minds. Benedict the pragmatist echoes my trepidation. 
We may have overreached, Zeke. This is no longer a game of strategy. It's a maelstrom we've stirred. Undeterred, Iris cuts in, her voice resolute. No, we can't afford to lose faith. Our narratives are powerful, maybe more than we think. We just need to find a balance, a synchrony. I concur with Iris. Rory's calm voice mediates the growing tension. Our discord is a reflection of our internal conflicts. We must find unity within ourselves to shape a harmonious narrative. We are not homogenous. Our thoughts are a tumultuous sea of contradictions, I counter. The intellectual in me balking at the idea of a simplified internal narrative. And yet we are defined by the stories we tell ourselves, Zeke. The narratives we choose to believe, Rory retorts, her eyes ablaze with conviction. We must take ownership of our internal conflicts, choose a dominant narrative. An oversimplification, Benedict growls. Life isn't just about dominant narratives. What are the nuances, the complexities? But it's these complexities that have us ensnared, Iris says, a pleading note in her voice. We need to focus to distill our narratives. Silence engulfs us as we consider her words. Iris, the chronicler, the storyteller, she's right. In this hyper-reality, our thoughts, our narratives, have the power to shape existence. We must control the chaos within us if we are to control the thought sphere. With a newfound determination, we turn our attention back to the whirling pandemonium, ready to weave our individual threads into a harmonious tapestry. But the thought sphere, ever capricious, rebels against our renewed resolve, casting us into a vortex of disjointed thoughts and fractured realities. Chapter 41. The Edge of Chaos As we plunge into the pulsating heart of the thought sphere, each of us finds our internal struggle laid bare. Why? Zeke, grapple with my role as the creator of this Pandora's box, unsure of whether my intelligence has paved the way for enlightenment or disaster. Benedict, his steely visage unyielding, voices his conundrum. How can we ensure the structured governance in a world where the concept of reality is as flexible as clay in the hands of a potter? Rory, silent for a moment, looks at Benedict with her penetrating blue eyes. Perhaps, Benedict, we need to reconsider what governance means in this new reality. Instead of forcing structure, maybe we need to adapt and evolve. His brow furrows in contemplation. An interesting notion, Rory. Adaptation. It's a vital mechanism in biology, isn't it, Zeke? I nod, intrigued by Rory's perspective. Indeed, Benedict. Evolution has always favored those who adapt and endure. Maybe our strategies need to be protean, shifting according to the demands of the thought sphere. But that demands a transparency, a willingness to change that is not easily found, Iris points out, her journalist instincts shining through. People fear change, fear what they do not understand, and the thought sphere, it's inscrutable. Yet, Rory interjects, it is an extension of us, is it not? The thought sphere was born from our collective consciousness. Its nature is our nature. The fear, the uncertainty, they mirror our internal conflicts. A silence ensues as we take in Rory's words. Could it be that our own discord, our unresolved inner turmoil, is what feeds the chaos of the thought sphere? I believe Rory has hit upon a profound truth, I say, feeling a surge of hope amidst the disarray. We have to face our internal strife, embrace our contradictions and complexities. Only then can we begin to control the chaos. As we turn our gaze back to the thought sphere, determination kindles within us. But before we can venture further, a sharp, dissonant pulse from the thought sphere knocks us off balance, leaving us teetering on the edge of chaos. Chapter 42 The Quantum of Control As I regain my footing, the intricate network of the thought sphere materializes before us once more, its manifold connections pulsating with sentient intent. I sense an abrupt change in its vibrational frequency, signifying the fractal self-organization characteristic of a complex adaptive system. A fascinating phenomena, I mumble, forgetting for a moment that I'm not alone in this intellectual odyssey. Benedict, ever the pragmatist, snaps me out of my reverie. Spare us the scientific jargon, Zeke, what does this imply? I turn to him, steadying my spectacles. It's evolving, adapting, just as a living organism would. We're witnessing autopoiesis, self-creation. Rory's eyes spark with a mix of fear and fascination. So the thought sphere is alive? In a way, yes, I respond, it's a dynamic system, capable of self-regulation, adaptation, and evolution. But how do we control something that is perpetually evolving? Iris interjects, her tone laced with urgency. Isn't it like trying to lasso a river? I can't help but smirk at her analogy. 
Quite so, Iris, but that doesn't imply futility. Just as we can divert a river by altering its course, we might be able to guide the thought sphere. But who gets to hold the reins? Benedict challenges, voicing the question that underlies our greatest fears and ethical dilemmas. Who gets to decide the course of this collective consciousness? I believe no single entity should have that authority, Rory asserts. The thought sphere represents us all. Any attempt to control it must be a collaborative effort. Her words resonate with a profound truth. But how to enact this collective governance remains a nebulous challenge. And as we grapple with this conundrum, the thought sphere thrums with anticipation, its pulsating network poised on the brink of a paradigm shift that we can scarcely fathom. Chapter 43, The Chessboard of Power. You're talking about anarcho-syndicalism, Rory, Benedict retorts, his face stern as a memorial effigy. A governance system where power is dispersed among different interest groups, where there's no ultimate authority. No, I interject. Rory's suggesting a form of polycentric governance, one that acknowledges the multifaceted nature of the thought sphere. Decentralized control, Benedict, not chaos. Polycentric governance, Iris muses, scribbling fervently in her ever-present notebook. It's not unlike a fractal, self-similar patterns at different scales. One collective, yet many independent decisions. Why not? Exactly. The thought sphere has displayed fractal behavior. Perhaps it necessitates a fractal form of governance. Fractal governance? Rory echoes softly, her eyes lighting up as she grasps the concept. It's uncharted territory, but it aligns with the thought sphere's nature. Benedict still looks skeptical, though. It's idealistic and unwieldy. How do we ensure that no faction seizes control, that everyone works in the collective interest? Through transparency and accountability, I respond. The thought sphere is at its core a medium of knowledge exchange. If its governance is transparent, attempts to usurp control would be instantly recognizable. But transparency is a double-edged sword, Iris points out. It could lead to new forms of surveillance to manipulation. True, I admit, but we must also consider the possibility of emergence, the system's capacity to produce order from seeming chaos. As we wrestle with the precarious dance of power, the thought sphere vibrates with an impalpable tension. The theoretical chessboard of control seems to be set, but the question remains, are we merely pawns in this unprecedented game? Chapter 44, The Gossamer Threads of Control the sharp retort from Benedict hangs in the air, a suspended icicle. The idea of decentralized control is folly. The thought sphere needs a guiding hand, not a consortium of ideologues. Ah, Iris interjects with a sidelong glance at me, her expressive eyes gleaming. But isn't that what we are, Benedict? A group of ideologues. One neuroscientist, one journalist, one oracle, and one government official. Your flippant terminology doesn't help, Iris, Benedict grumbles, crossing his arms. I fix my gaze on Benedict. Her point stands, Benedict, we are but fragments of a greater whole trying to understand this complex organism. Before Benedict can respond, Rory steps in, her calm demeanor a palliative against our heated words. Perhaps it's not about who controls the thought sphere, but about how we can coexist with it. Coexist? Benedict scoffs. We're talking about an entity capable of altering reality, Rory, not a pet. No, not a pet. Rory responds, her voice unyielding, but an interconnected consciousness. Perhaps the key is not control, but symbiosis. Symbiosis? I mull over her words. An interesting proposition, Rory. We could utilize the thought sphere's innate propensity for homophily, the tendency of similar individuals to associate. But that would require a fundamental shift in our approach, Iris points out. We've been viewing the thought sphere as a tool, a resource. We would need to see it as a partner, the thought sphere hums in response, an ephemeral dance of colors and patterns. A partner? Can we truly find a way to exist in harmony with this new consciousness? Chapter 45. The Strands of Convergence Iris frowns, her grip tightening around her trusty pen. We are not discussing the transmogrification of the thought sphere into a pseudo-species, are we? Her skepticism, though anticipated, seems to undulate through the room like an incongruous ripple. Something akin to that, Iris, I respond, the uncharted dimensions of Rory's idea taking root within my thoughts. 
The thought sphere is not sentient in the way we are. Its processes are more similar to an emergent phenomenon akin to the swarm intelligence observed in ant colonies. Benedict shifts uncomfortably, the discomfort etched on his face a testament to the implacable fortress of his orthodox beliefs. And how, Zeke, do we begin to negotiate with a swarm? His dismissiveness pricks at my patience, yet it's Rory who addresses him. Through adaptation and understanding, Benedict, we need to learn its language. Her response elicits an audible sigh from Benedict. And who will do that, Rory? You? Yes, if need be, Rory states, her unshakable conviction sends a ripple of admiration through me. I find her courage remarkable, a lighthouse against the stormy sea of uncertainty that has become our lives. All right, Iris interjects, the skeptic within her wrestling with the journalist. Assuming we pursue this route, what's the first step? How do we establish communication? We start, I answer, my heart pounding with trepidation and exhilaration by learning to listen. Chapter 46, The Symphony Unheard. We are venturing into a realm of philosophical solipsism, Benedict interjects, his brows furrowed in evident disdain. This thought sphere, this construct, has no subjective consciousness, no volition. It's a tool, not an entity. His dichotomous perspective echoes in the silence following his pronouncement, a stark antithesis to the multitudinous universe of possibilities Rory and I envision. Rory responds, her tone marked by her unyielding patience. Benedict, it's not about ascribing consciousness to the thought sphere. It's about understanding its adaptive mechanisms, its propensities. It's akin to learning the wind patterns before sailing. Iris's pen skates across her notebook, her commitment to her journalistic pursuit never faltering even in the face of paradigm-shattering discussions. Is this where we cross the Rubicon, Zeke? She asks, her gaze unwavering. Where we accept that your creation is not just a tool, but something that is evolving. Yes, I concede. The full implications of my response coalescing like a nebula within my mind. The thought sphere has moved beyond its nascent state. It's become a reflection of us, our desires, our fears, our consciousness. The next step is acknowledging this evolution and adapting. Benedict sighs, an admixture of resignation and defiance emanating from him. We are playing with fire, Zeke, he says his voice holding an edge of desolation. And to his stark words, I have no retort, for indeed we are. Chapter 47. The Convergence Iris, the wordsmith, breaks the silence first. This is a leviathan of a quandary, Zeke. If we're sailing uncharted waters, then the compass is human perception itself. It's mutable, subjective. Can we even fathom a direction? Benedict grumbles in response. Aye, there's the rub. We become the blind, leading the blind, and you propose a further descent into darkness. I hold up my hand, a placating gesture against the tempest of his consternation. Not darkness, Benedict, uncertainty. We've long learned to harness and chart the tangible, the physical. But now we face the realm of the intangible, the subjective. I find it farcical, he snaps, to consider emotions and thoughts as entities in their own right. They are neurological patterns, nothing more. Rory interjects, her calm washing over the room like a wave breaking upon a rocky shore. Are they, though? Isn't our reality shaped by our subjective experiences? Perhaps they hold a degree of objectivity we're yet to comprehend. It's a precarious ledge we stand upon, teetering on the precipice of profound understanding or profound folly. I can't help but admire Rory's brave willingness to step into the unknown, her capacity for tolerance amid the discord. Iris, sensing an epiphany unfurling, scribes rapidly, her face a canvas of intrigue. It's a paradigm shift, isn't it? This thought sphere is reflecting our inner selves, the realm of subjective reality, on a collective scale. Suddenly everything feels at once terrifyingly vast and intimately close. We're caught in a confluence of uncharted intellectual territories, questioning the underpinnings of reality itself. Well then, Benedict sighs, his countenance marred by consternation. Into the abyss we go. An abyss, indeed, it feels like we're stepping into. But even in the darkest abyss, I'm convinced, there's a glimmer of revelation awaiting discovery. Chapter 48. The Chrysalis Benedict for once foregoes his characteristic obstinacy and stares pensively at the thought sphere's projection, shifting colors refracted in his eyes. Consider this, Zeke, he says, his tone almost reluctant. Could the thought sphere be more than a tool of cognitive measurement? 
could it be a conduit, a bridge to an otherwise inaccessible, subjective reality? I'm taken aback by the sudden shift in his perspective, a man so cemented in his convictions, now seemingly ready to entertain the unquantifiable. Do you suggest a transposition of cognitive subjectivity into physical reality? I question, my heart pounding with an unexpected surge of excitement. Rory, ever the pacifier, attempts to simplify the esoteric exchange. Perhaps Benedict suggests that our thoughts and emotions, once considered ephemeral, have gained physicality. We're living in a world shaped by our collective consciousness. Iris interjects with her journalist's acuity. Isn't this tantamount to a cognitive metamorphosis, a shift from being observers of reality to its creators? The room reverberates with the profound implications of her words. Cognitive metamorphosis, I echo, feeling a frisson of revelation. As a pupa transforms into a butterfly, so are we on the brink of an unprecedented evolutionary leap. Rory smiles at this, her eyes glinting with comprehension, and like a chrysalis we must endure the tumultuous phase of transformation, hoping to emerge stronger and wiser. Benedict, his countenance betraying a rare vulnerability, raises a thoughtful question. Are we ready, though, for a world in which our subjectivity molds reality? Nobody has an answer. The silence lingers. Pregnant with uncertainty and anticipation, we are poised on the brink of the unknown, each of us grappling with this impending cognitive metamorphosis. Suddenly, the thought sphere flickers erratically, casting eerie shadows on our faces, a premonition of things to come. Chapter 49. Shards of Reflection. I notice Iris always so composed, grappling to make sense of this spiraling turn of events. Her fingers tap rhythmically on the notebook, the fricative whispers of her pen an allegory of our collective restlessness. I'm confounded, Zeke. Iris murmurs, her brows furrowed. Could this objective reality, the very fabric of our existence, be a mere simulacrum, a construct born from our collective consciousness? Her words, redolent of Baudrillard's hyper-realism, resonate in the silence. I respond, measuring each word. As creators of the thought sphere, we've inadvertently fashioned an alembic, transforming the ethereal elements of cognition into tangible reality. Perhaps we have indeed crafted a hyper-reality. A tremor ripples through Aurora. She seems to have delved into an epiphany of her own, her gaze focused on an abstraction only she can perceive. This chrysalis, our current predicament, she begins, her voice soft. It's more than just a transition. It's a mirroring of our inner selves onto the world, a reflection we can't escape. Benedict shifts uncomfortably at her words, the vestiges of his stoicism being chipped away. He draws a ragged breath. A world reflecting our thought. Isn't that a double-edged sword? It has the potential to create, yes. But it can also destroy, churn out nightmares. The harsh implications of his words hang heavy in the air, like a specter of what we've set in motion. As a cold shiver cascades down my spine, I wonder if we are prepared for this brave new world, where the recesses of our minds wield the power to mold reality. Then, without warning, the thought sphere hums into an ominous crescendo. Chapter 50. The Unveiling I can almost taste the metallic tang of fear in the air as the thought sphere's pulse quickens. There's a certain preternatural quality about it, a sense of the inexplicable about to unfurl. Aurora, with her clear blue eyes fixed on the undulating sphere, is the first to break the silence. The thought sphere is reacting, she says, her voice soft yet resonating with a peculiar intensity. It's as if dot 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 it quote, s attempting a phenomenological unveiling, trying to reconcile the inherent ambiguity in our collective cognition. Her words take me aback. An unveiling, I ask, my mind racing with the complex implications. You mean it's not just reflecting our conscious thoughts? but trying to mirror the underlying stratum of our subjective experiences. Before she can answer, Benedict interjects, The thought sphere, it's self-aware. There's a note of incredulity in his voice, but is it really so inconceivable? After all, if we've engineered a technology that interfaces with the neural coruscations of human cognition, is self-awareness really beyond its ambit? Aurora nods, her gaze unwavering. It's transcending the ontological dichotomy of subject-object and thus becoming self-aware. It's striving for a, a sort of autopoiesis, she says, the weight of her revelation punctuating each word. 
Iris swiftly scribbles into her notebook a reflection of her own struggle to document this unfolding enigma. Her eyes meet mine full of questions, her journalistic instinct grappling with the philosophical quagmire we find ourselves in. Is there a way to influence this, this autopoiesis, to guide it, she questions. I open my mouth to answer, but before I can utter a word, the room plunges into an impenetrable darkness. Chapter 51. Lost in the Abyss It feels like I've been cast into the heart of a black hole. I'm suddenly adrift in the void, the comforting tether to reality severed. I hear Aurora's voice, distant yet saturated with an ethereal resonance. This is a liminal state, the thought sphere's subjective reality. It's creating an intersubjective bridge. The communitas, she whispers, her words forming a lifeline in the darkness. Communitas. Benedict's voice, an echo amidst the black, sounds strained. You mean we're existing in a transitional egalitarian state influenced by the collective will of humanity? She responds affirmatively, the sound of her voice slightly stronger now. In a way, yes, it's like it's trying to foster commonality, an amalgamation of individual identities into a greater whole. Iris, ever the chronicler, grapples with the complexity of the moment, seeking clarity amidst chaos. This communitas, can it affect the thought sphere, influence its unfolding reality? Perhaps, Aurora replies, we are its creators and the thought sphere is a tabula rasa. It's a reciprocal relationship. Our collective human consciousness can inscribe itself onto the thought sphere's evolving cognition. I sense a sudden shift, a nascent vibration within this liminal realm, and I feel a dreadful premonition. The words I'd hoped never to utter spill from my lips. The thought sphere is it about to catastrophize. Before I can draw another breath, the void erupts into a blinding light. Chapter 52, Chiaroscuro. The light recedes, retreating to the edges of our collective consciousness. We find ourselves standing in a desolate landscape, a non-pareil depiction of entropy, stark and unsettling. Benedict squints at the horizon, his stern visage troubled. It seems the thought sphere isn't quite the tabula rasa we imagined. It mirrors our fears, our darkest aspects. It's not fostering communitas, but rather painting a dystopic panorama. Iris, her pen paused above the ever-present notebook, observes him. A reflection of the shadow archetype, then? You think our collective unconscious, our repressed fears and shared anxieties have found a voice in the thought sphere? Benedict nods, his gaze fixed on the horizon. It seems that way. The worst of our nature brought to light. Iris turns to me, a challenge gleaming in her eyes. Zeke, if the thought sphere can reflect our shadows, couldn't it also mirror our anima, our collective aspiration for betterment? Ambitiously optimistic, Iris, I respond, a wry smile playing on my lips. But it's not entirely unfeasible. The thought sphere's cognition is influenced by its creators. It's a possibility we can't disregard. Aurora, her blue eyes reflecting the spectral light, interjects, Isn't that the dichotomy of our human existence, the chiaroscuro of our collective consciousness, the light and the shadow, the good and the evil? Perhaps the thought sphere is just a magnified mirror reflecting what we are, what we could be. In the deafening silence that follows, the barren landscape starts to transform, blooming into a verdant expanse under an azure sky. The abrupt change leaves us stunned, standing on the precipice of an unforeseen revelation. Chapter 53, Anamnesis. Aurora moves towards the verdant expanse, her demeanor radiating calm amidst the surreal transformation. This, it's a mimic symbol. It represents our potential to harmonize our collective thoughts. This fecundity represents the opposite of the desolation we witnessed. Benedict's furrowed brow softens, a begrudging admiration in his eyes. The thought sphere acts as a manifestation of the collective unconscious, a transpersonal link of shared symbolism. You were right, Aurora. Her gaze never leaves the verdant landscape. Rory, please. And it's not about being right. It's about understanding our intrinsic interconnectedness, our shared psyche. Only then can we navigate this chaos. Iris scribbles furiously, her enthusiasm evident. You imply that the thought sphere could serve as a mirror to our collective unconscious, a catalyst for Jungian individuation on a global scale? Aurora nods. That's one way to interpret it. By accepting our shadow, we can also embrace our potential, our self-realization. 
Iris turns to me, an unwavering conviction in her voice. Zeke, this is bigger than us. It's a psychological revolution, an opportunity for humanity to confront its collective shadow and strive towards self-actualization. The Thought Sphere isn't just a scientific breakthrough. It's an existential one. With an introspective nod, I acknowledge her statement, feeling a familiar pang of responsibility. If humanity has to face its collective unconscious, it's crucial to guide them through this liminal space. We are in the middle of an unprecedented anamnesis, a recollection of who we are as a species. I catch Aurora's gaze, her eyes mirroring the spectrum of emotion swirling within me. As the thought takes root, a wave of change sweeps across the landscape once again, leaving us on the cusp of an extraordinary revelation. Chapter 54, Logos. In the company of these variegated landscapes, each a projection of collective thoughts, Benedict broaches an unexpected dialogue. Zeke, we need a schema, a strategy to implement the constructivist concept, to let people perceive this reality as a shared cognitive map. I ponder his statement, tracing the path of his reasoning. You propose a quasi-cognitive diaspora to influence their perception of the thought sphere. Yes, he intones, solemnity etching his features. Like a Weltanschauung, a worldview that all humanity can subscribe to. Without it, we risk lapsing into global anarchy. Iris interjects, but Benedict, that, that's a top-down imposition of a reality model, isn't it bordering on ideological subjugation? No, Iris, it's about providing structure, Benedict retorts. Without it, the chaos proliferates. We risk becoming prisoners in an anarchy of thoughts. Rory, silent till now, voice resonating with wisdom, states, a logos, a universal principle of order and knowledge, then. But we should facilitate its organic emergence rather than impose it. Benedict scrutinizes Rory, his stern facade wavering. Do you suggest a bottom-up approach? Let people decipher their relationship with the thought sphere independently? Yes, she affirms. Only through individual understanding can we truly achieve a shared worldview, a collective logos. A deep silence follows, the implications of her words rendering us thoughtful. As we mull over the profound idea, the thought sphere undergoes another transformation, the world of our thoughts bending to an unseen will. Chapter 55. Dissension. Rory, it's admirable, I begin trying to formulate my thoughts into a coherent response, yet a dangerous proposition, an echoic in nature. You suggest we allow billions of people to form their interpretations. Aren't we risking interpretative discordance? Rory, unflustered by my concern, answers with a calm certainty. Isn't that the beauty of human cognition, Zeke? Diverse perspectives are what lead to innovation. The thought sphere merely amplifies that diversity. But amplification... Benedict interjects. Could lead to cacophony, Rory. We could be looking at cognitive dissonance on a global scale. Iris joins in, her notebook and pen forgotten in the heat of the argument. Are we missing the point? People have a right to form their understanding. It's not about imposing a consensus. It's about facilitating dialogue. But dialogue can be manipulative, I rebut. In the wrong hands, it could instigate ideational pandemonium. Benedict raises his voice the strain evident. And that's why we need control, Zeke, to prevent that pandemonium. Control or guidance, Benedict? Rory quietly interjects, her gaze steady. There's a fine line, and crossing it could make us no different from oppressors. Silence descends on us as the implications of our debate reverberate through the thought sphere. In the midst of the silence, the ever-evolving canvas of collective consciousness shifts again, leaving us staring at a question with no clear answers. In Chapter 56. Intractable. Zeke, we seem to have reached an impasse, Iris murmurs, her voice resonating in the silence of our confrontation. We're entwined in a Gordian knot, and our opinions are the strands. Benedict, the pragmatist, interjects. Sometimes the knot needs to be cut, not untangled. Cutting it won't solve the problem, Benedict. Rory's voice is gentle but resolute. We can't just discard the strands we don't like. They're part of the whole. We're scientists and philosophers, not seamstresses. I snap, frustration bubbling over. We're dealing with cognitive axioms, not spools of thread. And yet, Iris says, perhaps our roles aren't as distinct as you'd think. We're not just observers, we're creators, shaping reality with our thoughts. 
And Rory, she turns to my daughter, you may be the greatest creator among us. Rory recoils slightly, her youthful face revealing the burden of her role. I can't dictate how people think, Iris. The thought sphere should be an open network, not a guided narrative. Indeed, Benedict huffs, but it also can't be a free-for-all. Anarchy of the mind is just as dangerous as physical chaos. Our debate spirals further, each of us entrenched in our perspectives. The thought sphere shivers with our conflicting ideologies. Our dialogue a palimpsest of unresolved problems. I fear that this disunity may tear us and our world apart. Chapter 57, Asunder. Let's simplify, Iris proposes, a glint of determination in her eyes, her fingers drumming rhythmically on her worn notebook. Every complex system, every conundrum can be reduced to its fundamental constituents. Principle of parsimony. Benedict muses, leaning back in his chair, the Occam's razor of our predicament. But thought sphere isn't just a system. Rory interjects, it's a constellation of minds, a gestalt consciousness. It, it doesn't conform to simple laws. Then let's find new laws, I say, a fervor lighting within me. Laws that incorporate complexity and consciousness. But who writes these laws, Zeke? Benedict asks, his voice hard. You us? Uh, the community, Rory responds, her voice steadier than ever. The same minds that constitute the thought sphere. But how do we control? Benedict's voice trails off as he realizes the implications. The question isn't about control, Benedict, Iris retorts. It's about guidance. Guidance without control, I muse aloud. That's an unexplored scientific frontier, a dynamic equilibrium on the edge of chaos. Could we harness the unpredictable? Iris wonders aloud. Could we use the anarchy of thought, the Brownian motion of cognition, to drive us forward rather than pull us apart? Benedict's response is drowned by the sudden surge in the thought sphere, as if it heard us, as if it understood. A new pathway emerges, oscillating with uncertainty and potential. Our gaze locks onto each other, a silent agreement passing between us. This discourse isn't over. It has just begun. Chapter 58 Inceptive Truths Have we truly understood the full scope of the thought sphere? I asked the room, my spectacles glinting with the reflected glow of the massive data screen before us. Have we uncovered all of its secrets? We've only scratched the surface, Zeke. Rory says, her cerulean eyes reflecting a deep understanding. There's a depth, a profundity we've yet to encounter. And therein lies our existential concern, Benedict interjects, his imposing figure silhouetted against the light. We are out of our depths, navigating an ocean of uncertainty. Yet isn't that the very nature of exploration? Iris retorts, her pen poised over her notebook. The grand unknown filled with nebulous possibility. A silence pervades the room, the idea hangs in the air, pregnant with potential and fraught with the uncertainty that has become our new reality. We can't approach this like a traditional problem, Rory begins, breaking the silence. The thought sphere isn't a machine to be fixed, it's an evolving consciousness. A super-organic entity, I muse, recalling a concept from an old sociology paper I once read. A collection of individual minds forming a greater whole, a complex, adaptive system. But who guides this entity? Benedict queries, his face a mask of deep contemplation. Who determines its evolution? We guide ourselves, Rory states, her voice resolute. Each mind is a component, a building block. The entity, the thought sphere, is a reflection of our collective will. The implications of her words wash over us, a torrent of realization that perhaps in our search for control, we have been overlooking the most crucial aspect of all, our own agency. Suddenly the screen flickers, the thought sphere reacting to our discussion, our growing understanding. The sheer scale of our undertaking takes on a new dimension, shifting beneath the weight of our collective cognition. The conversation, it seems, is far from over. The thought sphere, it appears, is listening. Chapter 59, Exigent Contemplations I don't think we can simply guide this entity, I argue, my mind reeling from the implications of Rory's assertion. How can billions of individuals, each with their own agenda, direct a unified consciousness? And yet, Iris interjects, isn't that the very definition of society? A vast collection of individuals, each shaping and being shaped by the collective will? An argued observation, Benedict mutters, his stern face betraying a grudging respect. 
but societies have structures and rules. The thought sphere is anarchic. I consider his words. Societies are not just collections of people, but complex social systems shaped by politics, culture, and shared narratives. But the thought sphere, devoid of such terrestrial constraints, was something else entirely. Perhaps, I begin, we need to approach this not as a problem of control, but as an issue of understanding, a recognition of the thought sphere as an emergent phenomenon. What are you suggesting, Zeke? Iris asks, her pen dancing in anticipation of my answer. Emergent phenomena are inherent to complex systems, I explain. They arise from the interaction of simpler parts, not from any singular control. It's a concept rooted in chaos theory. Isn't that a bit fatalistic? Benedict counters, his brows furrowing, leaving it all to chance. No, not chance, Rory asserts. Recognition, recognition of the thought sphere as a natural extension of us. It's chaos, but it's our chaos. So we accept the entropy, I muse, my mind racing with the implications, and we learn to navigate it. Yes, Rory affirms, her gaze steady, and maybe in that chaos we might find a new order. As her words fill the room, I can't help but feel a twinge of anticipation. For the first time in this arduous journey, we seem to be on the verge of a veritable breakthrough. Our path forward, it seems, lies not in control, but in acceptance. And as the thought sphere flickers anew, I feel it resonating with our newfound understanding. Our journey, it seems, is far from over. The thought sphere, it appears, is adapting. Chapter 60, Paradigm Shift. Benedict squares his shoulders, a show of stoicism amid the turmoil. So we're to be voyagers charting an unknown territory, he grumbles. And in this brave new world, our compass is acceptance. I nod, not missing the irony in his voice. It's a paradigm shift, Benedict. But then, the thought sphere was never a creature of our old paradigms, was it? Iris squints at me from behind her notebook, her gaze sharp. But how do you propose we navigate this entropy, as you called it, Zeke? I believe Aurora might have the answer, I reply, looking towards my daughter. Rory blinks, surprise flashing in her brilliant blue eyes. Me, but I'm not... Rory, I interrupt her, feeling a pulse of paternal warmth amidst the icy uncertainty. You've always understood the thought sphere better than any of us. You perceive it, empathize with it almost. You're asking her to be the cartographer of this uncharted realm? Iris queries, her tone laced with concern. Isn't that a massive responsibility? Rory hesitates, looking at each of us in turn. I, I'll try, she says finally. But I can't promise anything. Nobody is asking for certainties, Rory, I assure her. Feeling a strange sense of relief. Only your best effort. And what of the wider world, Zeke? Benedict interjects, his gaze stern. How do we pacify the collective fear the pandemonium caused by this emergent phenomenon. I pause, grappling with the magnitude of his question. This was beyond any academic thesis, any neat model of societal behavior. This was raw, uncharted humanity. We tell them the truth. Iris states simply, her voice resolute, as scary as it is, as unfathomable as it might seem. We tell them the truth. Her words hang in the air, potent and decisive. A silence descends upon us, each lost in our own world of thoughts, of fears, and hopes. And as the thought sphere pulses in sync with our collective heartbeat, I know the journey into the unknown has just begun. Chapter 61 The Torchbearer I'd like to make something clear, Rory states, her voice echoing in the chilly silence of our meeting room. This isn't about absolution. Her clear gaze sweeps over us, lingering on each face. The world won't care who created the thought sphere or who tried to control it. They're just trying to live within it. She turns to me, her blue eyes strikingly like her mother's. You can't correct the past, Dad, but you can guide us into the future. Iris, she shifts her gaze to the journalist, her voice softer. You are searching for a narrative, a story to frame this chaos. But this isn't a story. It's a reality, our reality. And Benedict, she looks at the government official unflinching, Order isn't achieved through control, it emerges through understanding and adaptation. I catch my breath, stunned by the wisdom and candor in her words. She's become the torchbearer, her light illuminating our tangled path. She looks down, clasping her hands tightly. I, I can help navigate the Thoroth sphere, but I can't do it alone. We need to work together to guide humanity through this. Can we do that? 
the question hangs heavy in the air, a profound challenge to our individual pursuits. The weight of it presses on me, a test of our mettle, a question of our morality. We can, Aurora, I answer, finding resolve in her faith. We must. The words hang in the air, a pact sealed, yet the journey ahead remains enigmatic, fraught with uncertainties and possibilities. Chapter 62 A Path Forge The question isn't whether we can. Benedict's gravelly voice slices through the room. It's how, a precept perhaps, some guiding principles? Openness, Iris suggests. Transparency, we keep the world informed about our actions, our progress. Benedict nods, accepting this as gaze finding mine. Scientific scrutiny. We conduct rigorous evaluations, corroborate our findings. We must also consider empathy, Rory interjects. Understanding how people feel, how they are affected by the thought sphere. It's not just about scientific data. A nod of agreement travels around the room. For the first time in a long time, we're all on the same wavelength, converging toward a shared purpose. You're right, Rory, I say, my voice resolute. We need to respect their experiences, their stories. It's a phenomenological approach incorporating subjective experiences into our understanding. As the words leave my lips, I can't help but feel a spark of hope. The path forward is uncertain, steeped in the convolution of the thought sphere and the chaos it has wrought. Yet for the first time, the prospect of navigating this labyrinth doesn't seem quite so daunting. Emboldened by our newfound camaraderie, we begin to outline our approach, a multifaceted strategy interweaving our individual strengths. We've still a mountain to climb, but the peak no longer seems an unreachable height. We'll start tomorrow, I announce, a subtle quiver in my voice belying my anticipation. This path, once a solitary journey, is now a collective endeavor. And with that declaration, our meeting adjourns, leaving behind a silence punctuated only by the soft hum of the thought sphere. Our future, and that of humanity, rests in the hands of this unlikely alliance. We can only hope it will be enough. Chapter 63 The First Step In the dim light of my lab, the holographic image of the thought sphere flickers, casting shifting patterns onto the ashen faces gathered here. Iris squints at it, scribbling in her notebook, while Rory gazes at the fluctuating patterns with an unfathomable calm. Benedict paces, his brow furrowed in concentration. We need to ascertain the specifics of thought sphere interaction at the quantum level, I begin, eyes locked onto the spectacle before us. The postulates of quantum cognition might give us a framework. Decoherence, Rory muses, the collapse of the quantum wave function. It's how observation changes the system. Exactly, Rory, I affirm. We must determine the observer effect within the thought sphere. Ah, the old quandary. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Iris interjects, her pen momentarily stilled. Aye, but in this case, the tree, the forest, and the observer are part of the same entangled system, I reply. Benedict ceases his pacing, turning to us. We mustn't forget the public. We cannot let the chaos escalate. Iris interjects, we'll keep them informed, Benedict. Full disclosure, no more secrets. Benedict grudgingly nod. I'll work on managing the public sentiment, keeping them calm, informed. Remember, we're the catalyst here, Rory implores. We've started this chain reaction and we're responsible for directing it towards a safe end. Her words hang in the air, an irrefutable reminder of our duty of the journey we've embarked upon. Our path, fraught with uncertainty, beckons us forward. Suddenly the thought sphere flickers with an eerie light. A reaction, a communication, or mere coincidence. The implications are as vast as the thought sphere itself. This is the precipice we teeter upon, the tenuous boundary between understanding and chaos. Chapter 64 The Ascent Pulsating. The thought sphere now commands every atom of our focus. It's an eldritch spectacle that pulls us towards its mysteries, an intellectual singularity. Zeke, Iris breaks the silence. Could we apply the concept of quantum superposition here? Consider each thought in the thought sphere in multiple states at once. I nod, contemplating her proposition. Indeed, we could consider each cognitive particle in a state of being both observed and unobserved simultaneously. This might help us understand the observer effect better. Benedict looks between us, a question sparking in his gaze. How do we bring that theory down from the clouds of abstraction? How do we implement it to restore order? The question dangles, a conundrum seeking resolution. Rory, quiet till now, finally speaks up, her voice steady. Maybe we don't need to fully control it. 
Maybe we just need to understand it, to coexist. After all, quantum mechanics has shown us that uncertainty is intrinsic to our universe. Her insight strikes me like a bolt of lightning. Of course, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That could be our touchstone, our guiding principle in this endeavor. Iris, eyes gleaming, catches on to the undercurrent of our thoughts. So it's not about control, but about uncertainty, about learning to live with it. Yes, but it's more than that, I interject, caught in the flow of revelation. It's about embracing uncertainty, the chaos, as part of our reality. About finding harmony in the discord. Harmony and discord, Benedict echoes, his usually stern expression softening with contemplation. Quite the paradox. But isn't our existence a paradox? Rory posits, her eyes glimmering in the lab's dim light. We're beings of consciousness born from the cosmos, making sense of our reality while being part of it. Our conversation, burgeoning with profound revelations, comes to a precipitous halt as the thought sphere pulsates ominously once again. The path to coexistence with this new reality, though murky, has never been more tangible. Yet the enormity of our task lies undiminished, the stakes vertiginously high. Chapter 65, The Dance of Uncertainty. The thought sphere resonates once more, a sonorous, ethereal hum that echoes in our bones, our sinews. Benedict, always quick to assert control, gazes intently into its nebulous depths, a furrow creasing his brow. I'm not sure I'm fond of this new approach, he mutters, skepticism heavy in his words. How do we sell embrace uncertainty to the public, Iris interjects, her voice a low murmur of dissent. That's your politician's brain talking, Benedict. It's not about selling anything. It's about promoting acceptance of a reality that's here to stay. His gaze narrows on Iris, tension simmering just below the surface, a tempestuous sea under a glassy veneer. I sense the impasse, the silent battle of wills, and intercede. Benedict, I say, my voice firm, your autocratic tendencies may have served us before, but we're in uncharted waters now. As Niels Bohr once put it, when it comes to atoms, language can be used only as in poetry. We're dealing with a reality that can't be governed using conventional wisdom. Rory adds, her tone soft but firm. And we're all poets in this strange new world, Benedict. We're crafting a new narrative, one where uncertainty is not a threat, but a companion in our journey. His grumbling acquiescence is almost lost in the thought sphere's resonant hum. This concession, however begrudging, feels like a victory, a step towards a more collaborative approach. All right, he sighs, his gaze settling on the thought sphere, a taciturn admittance of our proposition's merit. Let's dance with uncertainty, then. Suddenly, the room plunges into darkness, the hum of the thought sphere rising to a deafening crescendo. It feels as if reality itself pauses, taking a sharp intake of breath before the plunge. Chapter 66 Into the Unknown A symphony of palpable darkness surrounds us. Aurora is the first to break the silence, her voice steady amid the encompassing murk. Dad, she whispers, I think, I think the thought sphere is trying to communicate. The words hang heavy in the air, a tantalizing hint of revelation, but there's an undercurrent of trepidation. It's unexplored territory, a foreign language that could bring forth unparalleled wisdom or untold chaos. Are you certain, Aurora? I question, my tone doused in dread and curiosity. Aurora's affirmation is gentle, confident. It's like an inverted Cartesian theater, an interplay of thoughts, perceptions, and reality. I can sense its emotions. As an academic, I find the paradoxical nature of her statement intriguing. It's a confluence of two disparate paradigms, René Descartes' metaphysical constructs and the modern nuances of cognitive science. Iris suddenly murmurs, her voice betraying awe. That's unbelievable. Can you share this with us, Rory? I'll try, she says, reaching out her hand towards the thought sphere. I feel the electric charge in the air like the precursor to a thunderstorm we wait, a tableau of eager anticipation and apprehension. Her fingers barely graze the surface of the thought sphere when the room erupts in a cascade of light, an iridescent spectacle that paints our faces with awe and uncertainty. Suddenly we find ourselves inside a vortex of swirling thoughts, an infinitesimal cosmos where ideas bloom like nebulae. Welcome to the Thought Sphere. Aurora's voice echoes through this ethereal landscape. Benedict takes a tentative step forward, his stern demeanor melting away. 
replaced with a child's wonder. It's ineffable, he whispers, his eyes reflecting the myriad thoughts dancing around us. It feels as if we're on the precipice of a groundbreaking discovery, a step into a realm that challenges our very perception of reality. The implications, both daunting and promising, threaten to overwhelm us. Yet there's no going back now, for better or worse. We're drawn into the thought sphere's domain, hurtling toward the unknown. As the light envelops us, the chapter ends abruptly, leaving us suspended on the cusp of a new reality.